back to OTS News. My name is Mean Marky T. Pile driving geeks since 1973. The biggest R in the IWC. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I am so happy that we are now finally going into WrestleMania weekend. I don't know how many of you guys enjoyed that NXT shit, man, but holy shit, was that boring. How many of you enjoy watching those vanilla meetings? How many of you guys enjoy watching them work out of a gymnasium? <laughs> how do you guys feel knowing that SmackDown is the more superior brand? Dana, why are you looking at me? You're giving me those eyes, honey. I don't like it. I don't like it. You're telling me to be nice. Be nice to who? According to the ratings, according to my personal sources, no one even watches NXT. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we have some breaking news here tonight in regards to the OTS venue. Construction is still underway. And apparently, according to JD from New York himself, he got a rough draft of what the venue was going to look like on the inside. And he was told by the multi-million dollar construction team that he just hired that the venue will be completed in about three to five days. I know, I know. Your excitement levels are off the chart. I know. I can't wait either because I can't fucking hear myself with all this construction. God! Like I can't get any fucking work done around here. Man. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes I let my unprofessional behavior get the best of me. But this is going to be state of the art. Gonna look really, really sexy is the word that JD from New York has told me in regards to the venue. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we will be back with tonight's SmackDown rundown right after this small musical commercial break.
and gentlemen, welcome back to OTS News, and what you just heard were the sweet sounds of Carl KC and White Bat Audio. That one was called Execution. You hear that, Dana? Yeah, I know. Don't give me that look again, honey. I'm telling you right now. Anyway, tonight on SmackDown, we have a fatal four-way for the WWE SmackDown Tag Team Championships as the Street Profits will go up against the Dirty Dogs. And Boyaka, Boyaka, 619, Boyaka, Boyaka, Ray, and Dominic Mysterio. I am, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's another team here, Gable and Otis. Nobody gives a fuck about Gable and Otis, give me a break. I'm going with the Mysterios, because J.D. loves Boyaka, Boyaka, 619. Also, the Archer of the Giant Memorial Battle Royal will take place, and give me a break, folks. Nobody gives a shit about the Archer of the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. They might as well name it the Titus Catering Battle Royal, because that's exactly what the match includes. Everybody that lives and dies in catering, thanks to Bruce Richard. Also tonight is WWE's last night in the Thunderdome at Tropicana Field for SmackDown because the Tampa Bay Rays are moving back on in for the start of their MLB season. I don't know which one is worse, the Tampa Bay Rays or WWE Television on a weekly basis, folks. I don't know, maybe you guys know better than me, but both of them, in my honest opinion, are absolutely fucking dreadful. Tonight's drink special at the bar, ladies and gentlemen, is in honor of the one and only Bailey. Because give me a break, Bruce. How do you have Bailey on your roster and you don't have her in a match at WrestleMania? So tonight's drink special is in honor of Bailey. Tonight we have the role model mojito. That's all you need to know. Just go get it. It's fucking delicious, man. Who doesn't love a fucking mojito? And tonight's food special, ladies and gentlemen, coming out of the kitchen from Titus Catering is very simple tonight because we want to keep it simple going into WrestleMania weekend. Titus's own homemade mozzarella sticks with his homemade red marinara sauce. Let me tell you something, folks. These mozzarella sticks are breaded in panko breadcrumbs. The cheese in the center is melt in your mouth. And the homemade sauce, you can drink it right from the fucking bottle. That's how good it is. Ladies and gentlemen, the show is about to begin. This is your WrestleMania. <laughs> WrestleMania edition of SmackDown, really. It's SmackDown, ladies and gentlemen. And this is your post show right here with your host, JT from New York. It is WrestleMania weekend officially. We are live, man. SmackDown tonight with the go home show for WrestleMania 37. It was more like the video package go home show. 
Nothing happened on SmackDown tonight that is terribly important, man. Video packages left and right. A battle royal where the winner receives a $25 gift card to Target. And a tag team title match that, in the end, disappointed everybody. I also got your SmackDown news and rumors going into WrestleMania 37. And we're even going to sprinkle in some WrestleMania predictions for both night one and night two. Why? Because we're back in business. This is the biggest weekend of the year in the biggest way possible on the biggest show in the IWC. This is your SmackDown Post Show right here on Off The Screen. guys thank you so very much for joining me right here on off the scripts this is your friday night smackdown post show for april 9th 2021 i am your host jd from new york smackdown the final stop on the road the horrendous road the very boring road the very lazy road to wrestlemania night one is tomorrow night man it doesn't even feel like it it doesn't even feel like it whatsoever wasn't even a real go-home show tonight, man. It was just WWE putting on matches that they just opted not to put onto the WrestleMania card for, I'm assuming, time constraints. And they made SmackDown tonight the unofficial, unofficial night one of WrestleMania. Tonight we saw a fatal four-way for the SmackDown Tag Team Championships between the Dirty Dogs, Chad, Gable, Otis, the, Myster- the Mysterios and the Shree Prophets. Not really much of anything, man. Not really much of anything there. Just pains me. It really upsets me as far as just looking at those eight guys and wondering what they're thinking, why they aren't on the WrestleMania card, but somehow Nia Jackson, Tamina Snuka made its uh, way onto the WrestleMania card somehow. Whatever, man. It- it- it's just, it- It's just unreal. It really is. Then you got an Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. These are the only things that WWE really promoted tonight outside of Edge and Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns addressing the WWE Universe on their way to WrestleMania for the Universal Championship match that will be defended in the main event of Sunday in that triple threat match. Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. I still don't know what the importance is of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. I don't know why we have an Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. I don't know why anybody would want to win this thing. It does nothing for your career. What do they win? What does the winner of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal get? A $5 gift card to Dunkin' Donuts? How about a $10 gift card to Starbucks? Maybe it's a $100 gift card to Best Buy. Maybe it's a $50 gift card to Arby's. Right? Or maybe Cheesecake Factory, Applebee's, Fridays. 
Walmart. Which one? Which one do you want? Maybe it's a gift card to all four, all of those stores. Every single one of them. I don't know. But I'm still wondering what the winner actually gets in the battle royal. Nothing. A fucking trophy that looks like urine with your name engraved on a fucking plaque. And then you wonder, hey man, I won the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. What about my push this year? Then WWE can shill it in a video package. The memorable Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. It makes careers. What does it make? It makes your career for about three seconds. So much for Jey Uso that his celebration was short-lived because right out of the gate came Roman Reigns. Whatever. Whatever. The Battle Royal should really be for WWE uh, firing all these people. Really. It should be for your termination papers. Who the fuck wants to be associated with with this show, if you're any one of those guys, really. It was all catering VIPs in that battle royal, man. Awful. Chili's? How could I forget Chili's, man? Chili's is a great place. Chili's is a great place. I'd take a gift card to Chili's for that battle royal. We got a lot to go over today, man. We got news and rumors. We got predictions. It's not going to be, be really much of a SmackDown uh, post-show. As far as the actual show goes, nothing really happened, but... We'll go over. We got three incredible promos from Roman Reigns, Edge, and Daniel Bryan on their way to Sunday's main event. We'll go over what they said. All really have stated their case pretty damn good. We got the Battle Royal. We'll go over that. What I liked, what I didn't like. It's more of what I didn't like or what I didn't care about. And then the Fatal 4-Way for the Tag Team Titles on SmackDown. Here I am thinking that it was going to be an elimination match, but... It really wasn't all that important whatsoever. I got Roman Reigns news. I got Seth Rollins news. I got Paul Heyman news. I got Bailey news. I got Becky Lynch. That's a name you haven't heard in a while. Becky Lynch news. So we will go over all of that tonight right here on the podcast. Guys, I need you to do me a solid right now if you're watching On YouTube, live, right now. Everybody. There's 1,100 plus, almost 1,200 in this chat right now. I need every single one of you to hit that thumbs up. I need at least 1,000 thumbs up before we get out of here, man. And the reason why I ask right out of the gate is because it's Friday night. Tomorrow, we got night one of WrestleMania. I want to kick the road to WrestleMania off this weekend in the right way. 1,000 likes on the live stream right now. Let's do it. Follow me on Twitter, at JD from NY206. That's Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for all notifications, man. I've been a busy bee this week. Monday Night Raw, we were live. We got Wednesday, night one of NXT TakeOver, Stand and Deliver. I was live on Wednesday night right after the show went off the air. Thursday afternoon, Jesse and I were live for AEW Dynamite. We covered Dynamite still, even though there was a two-night TakeOver. So we got Dynamite Thursday afternoon. That's on the channel. Then I was back live on Thursday night for night two of TakeOver, Stand and Deliver. So if you missed any of that stuff, it is all on the channel right now. You have an entire week's worth of content to get through before we actually get to the main event, which is WrestleMania this week. Go and check it out, man. This has been the number one place for all of your opinions and news and everything in between for this busy WrestleMania week. And I appreciate all of the support. Thank you guys very much for making this the number one live stream, number one podcast every single night after these shows go off the air in the IWC. Make sure you guys get your super chats in. We will hang out at the end of the show. The chat is open. So let's talk. Let's have some fun. Give me your opinions on everything. If you want to ask me anything, the chat is open. We will go over them at the end of the show like we usually do. If you want to support the show, you could do that in a variety of ways. Obviously, like I said, hit the thumbs up. We already have 500 likes in the live stream already. Good job, guys. We need another 500 more. 
Make sure you guys hit the thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, turn on the bell. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Make sure you do that. If you want to support through the Patreon page, we got baseball bat beer mugs. We got t-shirts. Sign up annually. You guys are going to be a, a VIP member for the rest of the year, man. Make sure you go get your t-shirts. Bonfire is the exclusive home of Off The Script. The official Off The Script shop is on bonfire.com. Link is in the description below. Go get your masks. Mouthmasker.com. White or black. Now on sale. Mouthmasker.com slash OTS. And today's show is sponsored by Dr. Squatch. DrSquatch.com. Everything you need, man. All organic, all natural, men's hygiene, you name it. Shampoos, soaps, conditioners, deodorants. They got it all for you. Toothpaste. They got it all. I want you guys to smell your best, feel your best going into WrestleMania. And I want you to listen to the best right here on Off The Script. DrSquatch.com. Use code SCRIPT at checkout. And that is going to save you 20% off. Let's get into this show tonight, guys. Daniel Bryan opens the show tonight. He made his way to the ring. And the Thunderdome was leading a yes chant for Daniel Bryan as he marches into WrestleMania as one of the top contenders. One of the top contenders for the Universal Championship. So, Daniel Bryan smiled. And as his music faded, he started to say, we are so very close. We are so close to the biggest event this year, WrestleMania. He said he's excited and everybody is excited. I don't know about everybody. I'm excited for your match. I don't know if everybody's excited for this haphazardly built WrestleMania. But there are some people out there like that and I feel sorry for them. He said he's excited to see the set, the small pyro smoke, and feel the human air in Raymond James Stadium. He said what he's excited about most is to finally hear the roar of the WWE Universe in person. He said, don't get me wrong. I love the Thunderdome. This is incredible. Who knew this could be a thing? Look at this. This is amazing. Then he said, however, there is nothing like wrestling in front of a live audience. And the volume in his voice started to get higher and higher. As he said, there's nothing like winning the WWE title, which he knows, at WrestleMania. He said, that's what he can't wait for. He said, there will be 25,000 people chanting yes in unison. And there's nothing like it. He says he's often associated with the word yes. He said his career has often revolved around being told no. He said people said no to if he was big enough or belonged in WWE or if he was a superstar, or if he was best for business, or if he could face, or be the face of, of WWE, or if he deserved to be in the main event of WrestleMania. He said, if you ask Batista or Randy Orton or Edge or Roman Reigns, they will all tell you no. He said, if you asked him, he'd say, damn right I do. He said, every time he was told no, his parents and mentors told him to persevere and look for the truth inside him. He said that's where he found yes. A yes chant then started inside the Thunderdome. He said every time life told him no, he said yes. He said every time doctors said no to him wrestling again, he said yes. He said when people asked if he'd be champion again, people said no. But he said yes. He said when people asked if he could tap out Roman Reigns, Roman Reigns said no. But he said yes. So as far as him headlining WrestleMania one more time, at first Adam Pearce said no. But now he says yes. Everybody always puts down this show for being a joke or JD is negative. Yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Off the script sucks. When people always say no to JD, the numbers on this show always say yes. I know. I felt Daniel Bryan's promo. I felt Daniel Bryan's promo here. Said Sunday night is by far the biggest match of his career. Said one thing aside, he has Edge, who is furious right now because he thought he stole a spotlight that was all his. 
He said Reigns is enraged because he made him tap out for the first time in his career. And if he taps him out again, he'll lose his status as tribal chief and head of the table. He said enraged people are dangerous. He said they're not going to face GM Daniel Bryan or family man Daniel Bryan. He said they're going to get the best damn Daniel Bryan they've ever seen. The same one who tapped out Roman Reigns. The same one who will kick in Edge's head despite his neck. This is the Daniel Bryan with the fire in his eyes and the fire in his heart. And he is willing to do anything. Which leads me to one last question. Can Daniel Bryan walk out of the main event of WrestleMania as Universal Champion? Yes, yes, yes. Listen, man. I'm uh, I'm getting a little goosebumpy just thinking back to what we watched tonight with this promo. You know, a lot of people they did not jump on board with me in my pursuit to push Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns in the main event of WrestleMania. Everybody was like. Oh, it's Edge. Well, Edge and Roman is a better main event, and Daniel Bryan doesn't belong there. I heard this for weeks. Meanwhile, I've been pushing Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns as the sole main event of WrestleMania for the Universal Championship well before the Royal Rumble, probably dating back to a couple of years ago. As soon as Roman turned heel, I was pushing for it. Because it just makes sense. The story is there. Now that we saw what Roman Reigns has transformed his character into, and now we know what he is as a heel, and what we know of Daniel Bryan as far as him being a babyface, it just made the ultimate sense to put those two guys in the main event. I never thought Edge should have been in the SmackDown main event. I never thought Edge should have challenged for the Universal Championship. Never. I've always, and I'd never steered this ship away from this opinion. Edge should have absolutely challenged Drew McIntyre for the WWE Championship. Drew McIntyre should have never lost that championship to The Miz. Never. That was a huge mistake. WWE had Edge win the Royal Rumble. It was a mistake on their end to have him wait all that time to choose an opponent, ultimately choosing Reigns. It was a mistake for WWE to abandon the importance of the Elimination Chamber. It was ridiculous of WWE to give us a fast lane pay-per-view that when you look back on it, on this road to WrestleMania, it is absolutely unimportant and deemed irrelevant. There's nothing from that show that you remember. The one thing that you do remember from fast lane is Daniel Bryan tapping out Roman Reigns when the referee was down. The one thing you remember from that show is Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns giving you a WrestleMania main event preview. What you remember is those two guys giving you one of the best matches of the year up until this point. So again, I ask, where does Edge fit into all this? Daniel Bryan was always the guy. Daniel Bryan was always the main event of WrestleMania. You just never wanted to admit it. You were blinded by nostalgia. You were blinded by a comeback after Edge was out for eight months. You were blinded by WWE selling you on a bullshit main event that in the end never really looked like a main event and Edge never really looked like a main event guy. Sounds like one. He's a main event guy in name, but is he a main event guy in body? No, he's not. There was no story there with Edge. There was always a story with Daniel Bryan at Roman Reigns. The story now with Edge has nothing to do with the Universal Championship. The story now with Edge is why WWE turned him heel. Why did they turn him heel? Because they knew nobody wanted to see babyface boring. Fucking I'm going to chase my one final dream of being a champion and get back the championship that I never lost. Edge. Nobody wants to see that. The fuck do you need that for when you got Daniel Bryan doing the same exact thing? In fact, Edge. In fact, you should be thanking Daniel Bryan for being in the main event. Why? Because we would have never gotten the rated R superstar back. 
So before you tell me that I was wrong for all these weeks, you can fucking blow me. Kiss my ass. There's nobody in this community that has been more right every single week when it comes to WrestleMania than me right here on this show. None. I stand by that, and that's the fucking flag that I'm planting at the top of the mountain where I already sit. This promo was fucking grade A, organic, fantastic. Every aspiring young wrestler should look back at this promo and look at how it's done. If you want to be a blue collar, underdog, come from behind, sympathetic, babyface, you get no better than Daniel Bryan. None. Nobody does it better. Edge is only there because he won the Royal Rumble. As far as, uh, as, far as from what I'm seeing, Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns have had an issue for how many weeks now with Edge being the third wheel. Edge has felt like a third wheel this entire time. Why has now he finally fit into the main event? What made him finally fit into the main event? Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan is the one that made Edge into a main event WrestleMania challenger because of how good of a baby face he has been. Now I do question. Now I do question. Is Daniel Bryan going to get booed at WrestleMania? There could be a situation where Daniel Bryan walks in as this hot baby face and everybody's sympathetic with him. And he can walk into WrestleMania getting booed out of the building. I just find it very difficult to believe that people at WrestleMania are going to boo Roman Reigns. Seriously. I don't know how anybody could boo Roman Reigns. And now with Edge being back to the Edge that we all love... WWE did him a favor because undoubtedly, if he went into WrestleMania the way that he came out of the Royal Rumble, he would have been booed out of the building. So Edge may be cheered. Daniel Bryan, by default, is walking into this thing as the babyface. He may actually be the heel in front of the fans' eyes. It's a very interesting situation. It's a very interesting dynamic that WWE has created for themselves. Does Daniel Bryan win the Universal Championship? I don't know, man. Daniel Bryan pretty much promised he was going to tap out Roman Reigns at Fastlane. And a babyface, when you make a promise like that, should always keep their promises. He did it once. And now he's promising to walk out of WrestleMania as the Universal Champion. A lot of people are saying that this could be Daniel Bryan's last WrestleMania as a full-time performer. Who's to say WWE doesn't reward him in that? As long as Roman Reigns doesn't lose. Now, I'm not one of those people that want to see Roman Reigns lose the championship. There are legitimately people out there that want to see Roman Reigns lose the championship. Those people are mental. Those people don't have the best interest of the product at heart. You don't. I don't see how anybody would want to see Roman Reigns lose that championship. If WWE wants to reward Daniel Bryan with the Universal Championship, then by all means reward him with the Universal Championship, but don't have him pin Roman Reigns. Edge has more of a problem with Daniel Bryan than anybody. So have Bryan take out Edge if that is the case. If Edge is going to win the Universal Championship, it will be very short-lived. He will not hold that championship for a month. And if he does win, Brian is going to be the victim. Roman Reigns will not be pinned at all, nor should he. I would not, and again, I have to stress this because there'll be some fucking geek out there that thinks I want Roman Reigns to lose the championship. I do not want Roman Reigns to lose the championship. In fact, I would have him walk out of WrestleMania as Universal Champion and not lose that championship until he comes face-to-face with Dwayne at whatever WrestleMania WWE is doing that match at. Because you know what's happening. WWE has a very interesting dynamic going into Sunday night, and I'm very interested, and I want to say excited to see what happens. 
Because there was a moment tonight. There was a moment tonight where WWE teased a potential change to the WrestleMania main event. Now, we're going to get into what Edge said because his promo was, was just as good as Daniel Bryan's. But Edge cut an intense promo in the ring on Friday night, and he talked about how his return has been overshadowed by Daniel Bryan's feel-good story. Edge also had a gripe about Bryan being inserted into this match with him and Roman Reigns. After the promo was done, Sonya Deville was shown backstage with Adam Pearce, and she told Pearce that she feels that it is unfair for the Universal Championship to be defended in a triple threat match since it means the champion can lose the title without being pinned. Couple teases here. Are they foreshadowing Roman Reigns being pinned without actually, or losing the championship rather, without being pinned? Are they foreshadowing him losing that without being pinned? Are they foreshadowing a potential change to the Universal Championship? What are they going to do? Are they going to take Brian out? Are they going to come up with a storyline to take him out of the match? I think right now it's too late to do that. One of the ideas that I had, and one of the ideas that I had pitched, would be for Roman Reigns to challenge Daniel Bryan, or Bryan to challenge Reigns on night one of WrestleMania, have Roman beat Bryan, and then Edge gets his match on night two, and Roman beats Edge. With Roman main eventing night one and night two, which will never be done again. And he beats both Brian and Edge, and he solidifies himself as the tribal chief and the head of the table. That's what I would have done. They opted with the easy way, triple threat match. Because they got to give their main event to something else on night one. But if you really break it down, the main event of WWE, and he has been since SummerSlam, is Roman Reigns. Nobody is greater than Roman Reigns in WWE right now, so I would have actually taken that and maybe done that at WrestleMania. But are they foreshadowing these things happening? Is there going to be a change? Is Roman going to get pinned or not? Is he going to lose the championship without being pinned? I don't know. I don't know. So we'll get into what Edge said. We'll get into what Reigns said. This was Brian in the open. Unbelievable promo. I loved it. He deserves to be there, and he makes the WrestleMania main event a true main event. Simple. Kayla Braxton interviewed the Street Profits, and Dolph Ziggler and Bobby Roode attacked them in Gorilla. They brawled onto the stage. Cole said they were expecting a fatal four-way for the SmackDown Tag Team titles. Otis and Chad Gable came out. The Mysterios joined in, and we went to commercial Things were getting under control, and this was the first match of the entire night here. So after the break, Ford was in control against Bobby Roode. As Otis took over against Ford, Graves said Gable had an incredible effect on Otis's career. And I found this to be interesting because, you know, Otis, a lot of people didn't really understand what they were doing with Otis. Otis looked like a a, a fumbling fool out there. He didn't know what he was doing. He looked sloppy. He looked just lost. WWE put the Money in the Bank briefcase on him for absolutely no reason. They had no plans for him as Money in the Bank briefcase holder. None. They took Tucker Knight away from from him for, for no reason. Poor Tucker Knight, huh? First one eliminated in that battle royal. Gone. You're better off just giving him his fucking termination papers. So they took Tucker from Otis. They paired him with Chad Gable. And they've been a pairing for a little bit now, which kind of angers me, but I guess it's time to move on from that. But WWE had sent Otis reportedly down to the Performance Center to start working on being a better big man. And I got to admit, Otis is looking a little bit more intense. The comedy stuff has kind of gone away for a little bit. Now, I always found Otis to be a little endearing. I thought he was genuine. I find him to be real. I find him to be a genuinely funny guy. I find that to be the Otis in real life. That's why everybody loved him. That's why everybody really liked heavy machinery. But I got to admit, man, this Otis, this more intense Otis, this more physically brutal Otis is really growing on me. Now, I don't see him as a main event guy, but 
This is the type of Otis that we sh- we should have seen even when he was a babyface. A little bit of this, a little bit of the comedy. Shows his charisma, shows his big man status. So I'm really liking what Otis is doing here. Not necessarily with Chad Gable. I think Chad Gable should be a solo. But I'm liking what they're doing with Otis. I doubt it just goes anywhere. Gable tagged in and... He scored a near fall after a Northern Lights suplex, which always looks fucking great. Ford ate a Ziggler drop kick, and then Ford countered a Famouser from Dolph, turned it into a powerbomb. Dawkins and Rude both got hot tags. Dawkins took care of Rude and also fended off interference from Gable. Ray Buyaka Buyaka, 619, tagged in, and he took Rude down with a senton, and then he tagged in Dominic, they set up for the double 619 against both Rude and Ziggler. Dominic landed the frog splash on Rude. I thought this was it. I thought the Booyaka Booyaka 619 father son combination was going to win the tag team titles here, but Otis broke up the cover with a huge running splash. Ray dove at Otis, but Otis caught Ray and threw him out of the ring. Ford landed a running flip splash onto Otis on the floor. Dawkins and Gable tagged themselves in. Each scored two counts on sunset flips and reversals. Ford then blind tagged himself in and landed a frog splash on Gable that was absolutely devastating, man. And it's not because Montez Ford hit the frog splash flat 100%. He actually overshot it and both of his knees right into Gable's chest. That shit looked like it fucking sucked. It really did, which made the move all that much more devastating. So Ziggler super kicked Ford out of the ring. Rude tagged himself in and covered Gable for the win off of the Montez Ford frog splash. I'm sure this will get the Street Profits another tag team championship match. WWE will use this as storyline because Montez hit the finisher. They were about to win. Bobby Roode and Dolph Ziggler took advantage because of the fatal four-way rules. Pinned Gable off of his finishing move. It's an easy in for the babyfaces to lobby for another rematch against Dolph Ziggler and Bobby Roode in a standard tag team match with the titles on the lines, which I do expect sometime after WrestleMania, which is why Bobby Roode and Dolph Ziggler retained here. But if this was in front of WrestleMania, if this was actually at WrestleMania in Raymond James Stadium in front of human beings, it it would have been very difficult to not give the tag team championships to Ray and Dominic Mysterio. And I still wonder why this match wasn't included on one of the nights. I, I don't really get it. You could have easily put the women on SmackDown tonight for the gauntlet eliminator. You could have crowned a number one contender for the Women's Tag Team Championships on night two tonight and put this match on night one. I don't know who is interested in the myriad of trash that is in that gauntlet eliminator, uh, whatever they're calling it, women's match on Saturday night. The only reason why it's there is because WWE needs to get another women's match on the show. People have been crying about it. People have been asking for it. But is it deserved? More than likely, it's not. I don't see why Billy Kay needs to be on WrestleMania. Lana? The fuck has Lana done? Half of these teams don't even belong on the show. Not everybody should get a WrestleMania spot. These four teams have been battling for the last four months. Why isn't this on the show and the women's match happened tonight? That's just my opinion. But the heels win here, which is the right call. It's in front of nobody. It was in the Thunderdome. And I really believe if this was in front of fans, the Mysterios would have won the Tag Team Championships. But we're getting a rematch between the Dirty Dogs and the Street Profits after WrestleMania, and I expect the Street Profits to win the titles back. Kayla. Kayla interviewed Bianca Belair. And she said she has butterflies. It's fine. You can have butterflies in your stomach. She said she's nervous. But her dad told her it's okay to be nervous because it says that you actually care. She then raised her voice 
and started to say that he raised her to not be scared of anything. And she wants to win so badly and has been working so hard. Kayla said Sasha has been here before and people say she is determined to win. And that makes her a much more dangerous Sasha Banks. Belair says she's the EST of WWE with all the tools to win. So that makes her dangerous. She said when she beats Sasha Banks and becomes the SmackDown Women's Champion, that's going to be the greatest match of her life. You know, I might be in the minority here. You know, some people may misconstrued what I say here to be somebody who takes this shit way too serious. But I also don't want my intelligence insulted. First of all, the feud between Bianca Belair and Sasha Banks is fucking garbage. I I don't even know what the fuck they're feuding over, okay? There's no way anybody's going to tell me that something couldn't have been done better between these two women. WWE has botched it for weeks, They made it about the tag team championships. They made it about fucking Reginald for weeks up until about three weeks ago where they finally put focus on the SmackDown Women's Championship, okay? I don't know what it is with Bianca Belair right now. I mentioned this on my Monday Night Raw show when I go live for Monday Night Raw. Rhea Ripley comes off as overproduced. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the presentation, the mannerisms, the music, the look, the vibe. Rhea Ripley just comes off incredibly overproduced. It almost comes off as fake. Now, I'm not saying Bianca Belair is coming off as fake. I do think that she's genuinely nervous. I'm a big Bianca Belair uh, you know, supporter. I love Bianca Belair. I think she is absolutely one of the future pieces of this company for women's wrestling. I've been a fan of Bianca and I've watched her grow and I've watched her mature when she first made her debut in the Mae Young Classic several years ago. She was great then. Then she sat in NXT for a little bit. Then she finally found time on NXT and we just watched her grow every single night, every Wednesday. She became more and more of a mainstay on NXT when they were at one hour. But I don't know what it is with Bianca Belair, man. I feel like Bianca Belair is overproduced. I feel Bianca Belair with the promo and the words that she's given to cut, I feel like it just comes off as disingenuous. Now, it it, it may just be me. I, I don't know. I don't know. But this is the vibe that I get. You know, Bianca Belair is all happy and all humble and all this and all that. She's nervous. I don't want to see a smiley Bianca Belair. I don't want to see a humble Bianca Belair. I don't want to see a baby face Bianca Belair that's going to be sympathetic to what's going on here or ask for sympathy for what's going on here. You won the fucking Royal Rumble. You carry yourself as the EST of WWE and you're the best at what you do. And you're standing there all smiles. There's nothing to smile about here. The smiles should have ended on February 1st when you won the Royal Rumble on January 31st. That's when the smiles should have stopped. As soon as you won that Royal Rumble, now business is about to pick up. Now it's all business. You choose which champion you want to go for and then you go after that champion and you make that championship your number one priority. You do whatever you have to do to tell us why you are better than Sasha Banks. I ask everybody watching me right now, has Bianca Belair shown you and told you and explained to you why, how, if she's better than Sasha Banks? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen anything in regards to any of that whatsoever. Enough of the smiles, enough of being humble, enough of getting sympathy from these poor simps online where all they see is a very attractive female performer and they're fucking fanboying and fangirling over Bianca Belair. Bianca Belair has shown you absolutely nothing 
as to why she should be SmackDown Women's Champion. Bianca Belair has done nothing outside of winning the Royal Rumble to really deserve a main event of WrestleMania. Does this feel like the main event of WrestleMania? No. Does Bianca Belair look like a main event performer? No. The only reason why she's in the main event is because WWE touts the winner of the Royal Rumble headlining WrestleMania. I don't feel any of this in regards to Bianca Belair. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and say she doesn't deserve shit. I'm going to go out on a limb and say she's not ready for this primetime spot yet. And if you don't like what I have to say, go watch somebody else who's going to fucking drool over Bianca Belair and explain to everybody how this is going to be the best women's match of all time. No, it's not. Does it deserve to main event WrestleMania? Yes, but with an asterisk next to its name. Why? Because Bianca Belair won the Royal Rumble. And there's no excuse for WWE to not have it WrestleMania main event because of the two night factor. That's the only reason why Bianca is in the main event. If this was a solo WrestleMania, this match would barely open the show. Based on what Bianca Belair has been booked like, what this feud has been booked like, and what they've done to butcher the Bianca Belair character. They need to do better. She didn't sound like this in NXT. She didn't carry herself like this in NXT. She was a bad bitch in NXT. She showed you and made you feel why she was the EST of WWE. On SmackDown, I don't think she's any of the things that she says she is, especially more so than Sasha Banks. I just find it very difficult to believe in Bianca Belair. And that's because of WWE creative. I'm not even blaming her. This is everything I say here is in regards to WWE creative. Please keep that in mind. It's all Bruce. It's all Vince. It's all these fucking idiots. These suits backstage who think they know, but they really don't know jack shit. And Sasha's got to suffer for it as well. Now, what I would have done, to be perfectly honest with you, and you're not going to like this. Oh, but JD is an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I would have had Oscar challenge, or rather Bianca challenge Oscar. Makes more sense than fucking Rhea Ripley. I would have had Bianca challenge Oscar. Why don't they go and do that? Oh, but JD, Bianca can't challenge Oscar. Montez Ford, the man she's married to, is on SmackDown. They work out of the same fucking building. Who gives a shit who you challenge? You're working out of the same building. You probably live five minutes from the fucking Thunderdome. Give me a break. Bianca Belair should have challenged Asuka. So Asuka would have had an actual opponent with some storyline going into it. Maybe. On Monday Night Raw, I don't know what the fuck is a storyline. But it makes more sense than Rhea Ripley. And instead of keeping Bayley off the show, I would have had Bayley win the Royal Rumble and Bayley challenge Sasha Banks so they can finish up their storyline, which felt rushed. And WWE had the blow-off match on SmackDown after a great Hell in a Cell match. And then they just abandoned everything Bayley when she lost that SmackDown Women's Championship. Which bothers me a little bit because these two women, Sasha and Bayley, carried this fucking company through a goddamn pandemic in an empty gymnasium for months. And now she doesn't have a WrestleMania match? Bianca and Asuka was the main match that they should have made. Meanwhile, you gave Sasha Bailey, and you would have had two matches with plenty of time to build a story with one already pretty much ingrained in everybody's mind with Sasha and Bailey. Doesn't take a lot of effort to book that fucking story. They just don't know how to fuck shit up. WrestleMania right now, from what we've already discussed about with Daniel Bryan, to now, WrestleMania should really look like Roman versus Bryan, Edge versus McIntyre, Sasha versus Bayley, and Bianca versus Asuka. I'd take my WrestleMania over anything that you see right now on WWE television. Just by those four matches alone. Moving on. We got a Big E video package. 
a Big E video package that was straight fire. This was awesome. Big E, he was shown in and around Tampa. I want you guys to keep that in mind. Big E is from Tampa, Florida. Big E going back to his roots earlier in the week. They showed him in a barbershop, getting his hair clipped, trimmed. Big E said Apollo Crews is making a big deal about going back to his roots. But Big E never left his roots. He said Tampa is his home. And this is where he goes when he needs to get his mind right. He pointed out places he trained for during wrestling practice where he's learned discipline and how to handle the grind to become state champion. Said 17 years ago, he played his high school all-star game at Raymond James Stadium. Said he owns a piece of the soil from the field and he will walk in and walk out of that stadium as the intercontinental champion. He said for Cruz, that is the stadium where his IC title dreams come to die. Big E is slowly cementing himself as a legit Main event guy. This promo was fantastic. Fantastic. The only thing I have to ask, Bruce, and I'd love to know the answer to this question. If you knew this match was going to be at WrestleMania for the Intercontinental Championship, and you knew WrestleMania was going to be taking place at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa, Florida with fans... Why did it take you mere hours before WrestleMania to give us the fact that Big E is a hometown babyface? Does anybody find that to be a little bit bizarre? You had all these weeks, all these months in which these guys were feuding over the IC title, and you choose the night before WrestleMania to tell me and everybody else about this feud, this match at WrestleMania. You wait till the night before WrestleMania to tell me that Big E, or at least give us the aspect of Big E being a hometown guy, walking into his hometown, his hometown stadium, his champion defending his Intercontinental Championship against Apollo Crews, the enemy? Doesn't that sound ass backwards to you? Because I know if I'm booking a wrestling show, that would be highlighted right from the word go. But this is WWE. Maybe they forgot. Maybe it wasn't just important to them. Maybe this match means nothing to them. Give me a break. WWE letting another huge important detail fall to the fucking ground and just ignore it. Awesome. You got to love the WWE creative team. Now... Apollo and Big E will be wrestling for the Intercontinental Championship. This is actually a Nigerian drum match. If you're asking me what the fuck that means, I have absolutely no clue. I don't know what the hell a Nigerian drum match is, but apparently WWE is keeping it secret, folks. They don't want you to know until you actually watch the match unfold at WrestleMania. Now, the reason why WWE is keeping it secret is not because... They want to surprise you when the match actually happens at WrestleMania. The reason why WWE keeps this thing secret is because, here's a little clue, folks, for everybody that's new listening to the show. When WWE keeps things secret, it means that they don't know what the fuck they want to do. They have no idea what the fuck a Nigerian drum match is. They just do, they say, they promote, and they have no plan. They have no fucking idea what a Nigerian drum match is. You know when they'll have an idea? At 6.30 when this match happens. When is it happening? On night one? Night one. No, night two. 6.30 on night two. That's when you'll know when a Nigerian drum match or what a Nigerian drum match is. Which in my eyes is more than, uh, it's no more than a, a no DQ match. Or a false count anywhere match. That's all it is. No rules. It's another one of these WWE gimmicks that equates to no DQ. Moving on. We got Tamina. Maybe we shouldn't move on. Tamina versus Nia Jax. 
The less I say about this, the better. Tamina wins in three minutes via DQ. So we got uh, Jax and Tamina shoving each other, slapping each other. Tamina avoided a Jax charge who went shoulder first into the ring post. Baszler stood on the ring apron to distract Tamina as she stood on the second rope. Natalia ran up to Shayna Baszler. Baszler then shoved Natalia into the ring post herself. Tamina super kicked Jax, gave her a Samoan drop. Baszler broke up the cover and the referee DQ'd Nia Jax and that was it. That was it. There was one part in the match that uh, really was not bad. I don't believe I'm saying this. It was not bad. There was a spot in the match where Tamina legitimately, it looked like she stiff-shotted Nia Jax right in the face. And Nia Jax looked legitimately thrown off by it. Nia Jax shoved Tamina down. There was a big pull-apart brawl. It looked organic. That's the only part I liked about what these th- what these two women, these three, four women did here. That was it. That was it. But other than that, this is the most unimportant part of WrestleMania. Whatever's going on with the Women's Tag Team Championships, nobody cares. Nobody. And if you do care, you're lying. Or if you tell me you care, I know that you're lying. You're lying right to my face. Speaking of the Women's Tag Team Championships, Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot. We're being interviewed by Kayla. Carmella and Peyton Royce interrupted. Riot said that she and Liv are more laser-focused on their match at WrestleMania than ever before. Kayla asked what gives them the edge. Riot said besides getting rid of their sidekick, Billy Kay, they've learned from their losses and they're more in sync than ever before. So Carmella and Billy Kay walk on through and Carmella said that's cute. But if she wanted a lesson on friendship, she'd watch an after-school special. In walked catering. She made the wrong left turn. I figured she'd know where catering is, but uh, she obviously got lost. In walked catering and her partner, sidekick catering, 1.5. Then Naomi and Lana walked in. And Liv Morgan asked, are we really doing this again? And they all started brawling. Tamina and Natalia joined in. And they were the ones standing over everybody in the end during this segment. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. I will probably be cleaning my cat's litter box during this show. I'll probably save a shower for this match. I would probably go into the kitchen and make myself a nice yummy snack during this match. I'll have it on in the background. I'll know what's going on, but I don't care. I do not care whatsoever. So we got another video package. A night of video packages, folks. A video aired on Cesaro, and it was almost framed like a political advertisement for Rollins and Cesaro. Just think about, like, the presidential uh, campaigns that they do when you see the commercials on late-night television. You know, this, this ad is sponsored by and paid for by Donald J. Trump, right? Or something like that. So, think you know Cesaro? Think again. The narrator said he has been in WWE for 10 years, but he's never had a singles match at WrestleMania and has obviously never won the Universal Championship. So the narrator then asked, is this the kind of example we want for our children? Then it shifted to shilling Seth Rollins with a shift in tone and some uplifting music, celebrating his iconic moments in WrestleMania history. Seth Rollins knows what it's like to take charge, lead, and win. He's a man all of us can look up to and aspire to be. Seth then said, embrace the vision. And then Seth's voice then said this ad was paid for by friends of Seth Rollins and has nothing to do with Seth Rollins himself. I actually, I actually enjoyed this. I really did. I thought that was a fun take on Cesaro and Seth Rollins and one final push towards their match, which I'm very much looking forward to on Saturday night. I think it's going to be one of the best matches of the the weekend. It may be the best match of night one, and I'm expecting it to be, no question. But I thought this was really, really well done and really fun. I got two things on Seth Rollins. Two things on Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins says fans naturally react in the moment, and hate on everything immediately. 
He says Finn's natural reaction at first is to initially hate everything. I find this funny that he said this. And he was interviewed by emo fuckface with the terrible haircut who lies to his barber and stalks porn stars at Whole Foods that are shopping for organic lettuce. That's who interviewed him. Seth Rollins was interviewed by this clown on his podcast I will not mention here because it fucking sucks. Seth Rollins talked about the difficulties of being a babyface nowadays. Says, and I quote, which this is comedy hour, folks, so grab a box of popcorn, grab your favorite snack, grab your favorite cold beverage. Mine is a liquid death sparkling water from the Austrian Alps. I love it. That's me shilling liquid death, by the way. One of my favorite beverages for the podcast. Rollins talked about the difficulties of being a babyface nowadays. Listen to this, and I quote. When you're a babyface in this era, it is hard to keep people liking you. It is difficult because I think people's natural reaction, for whatever reason, is to dislike almost everything, and I don't know why that is. That's what entertainment has turned into. So to be frustrated, unsatisfied, or not like something, that's what's cool. Especially when you're told you're supposed to like it. And so it becomes pretty hard to not let that go to your head. End quote. He also said while speaking to this fucking idiot on this podcast that I will not name because it fucking sucks. He says that the Thunderdome allows WWE to tell their stories in a better way inside the Thunderdome. So when they're in the Thunderdome, it's not really filtered with the CM Punk chants. He appreciates not having to deal with the CM Punk chants and he doesn't have to deal with the fans who are hijacking the show. He says this and I quote, I still think social media still plays quite a role in how shows are written and how characters are portrayed. The Thunderdome allowed us to tell our stories a little cleaner in the sense that things aren't up and down as they may normally be. Whether that's good or bad, I'm not entirely sure. I miss the fans and live interaction, but I like being able to cut a promo and get all the way through without having to side-eye the audience. It's nice to get through a promo without being interrupted by CM Punk chants. End quote. I don't even know where to begin with this. First of all, I find it hilarious. I find it hilarious that he says he misses live fans and live interaction. And he says that the stories are able to be told a little cleaner in the sense that things aren't up and down as they may normally be. What stories? What stories? Is there any stories on Monday Night Raw? Zero. Zero stories. The only story that exists on SmackDown is the one with Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns with Edge going into WrestleMania night two for the Universal Championship. That is it. Everything else does not constitute as a story because there is none. There's no story in anything. I'd love for somebody to tell me what Rhea Ripley and Asuka is and what the story is there. So what stories are there, Mr. Rollins? And you say you love the fans and miss the live fan interaction and it's difficult to be a baby face in the type of world that we're in right now. It's difficult to be a baby face. Let me tell you something, Seth. Everybody would love you as a baby face if you didn't fuck up at social media. You fucked yourself up. Seth screwed Seth. Seth fucked Seth. That's the gist of it. Who was it that complained to Will Osprey? Oh, hey, I make more money than you. I'm better than you. And we have a better version than you. Not even talking about myself. A better version than you here on Monday Night Raw. And Ricochet, who just won the United States Championship. Man, oh man, Seth, I'd love for you to tell me where exactly uh, Mr. Ricochet is right now. I'd love for you to ask the fucking host of this goddamn fucking piece of shit podcast that you were on where exactly Ricochet is and what value he holds to WWE. 
So much that he got eliminated in a worthless battle royal tonight that is not WrestleMania. Or what about the time where you actually threw John Moxley, Jonathan Good, one of your best friends, somebody that you travel the fucking road with for years? How about the time you you threw Jonathan Good under the bus? telling everybody that with him going to AEW and him doing the things that he did to walk out of WWE the way that he did to go to AEW, that he's now taking food off of your table. You know, Roman Reigns had an interview not too long ago, and he always says that he talks to Jonathan Good maybe once a month to check on him and see how he's doing and yada, 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 that there's no harboring ill will feelings there. No, but he's taking food off your fucking table. You don't think people react and see this on social media and then take this venom and this hate for you to the venues? So who exactly is fucking who over here, Seth? It's the fans' fault? Or is it your fault because you fucking suck at social media? So much so that you actually wanted to quit social media, but your fiancé convinced you otherwise. Seth Rollins is a fucking idiot. He's drinking so much WWE Kool-Aid, he doesn't even know what the fuck he is saying anymore. And you would think that the fucking idiot host of this podcast would not allow these types of fucking questions and answers to be given on the show when there is so much more to the fucking story as to why Rollins is not a babyface and why he tried to be a babyface and failed at it. No, but it's the fans' fault, right? It's the fans' fault. Who is it that actually did not speak up when he was Universal Champion? Where he went into Hell in a Cell against the most over-fucking character in the entire company in Bray Wyatt. Didn't anybody realize that this may be a mistake? How you were booked during SummerSlam to take the title back from Brock Lesnar? How you look like a blithering pussy during that entire back and forth with Lesnar? No, but that was the fans though, right? No, that wasn't you. That was completely uh, not on you, right? You got the script every week. You didn't really look at it and answer, ask any questions and question anything. You just went and did your job because you're a fucking shill. That's why. The fans have every right to do and say as they please, as long as they're respectful, to do and please what they want. Give me a break. Rollins lives in denial because he knows he fucked up. He'll never be the same again. And the hate he gets as a, as a heel, that's not genuine. That's not Tommaso Ciampa heel heat. That's get the fuck away from me. Get off my TV heel heat. I'll give Rollins all the credit in the world. He's one of the best wrestlers in the world. We're easily in the top five WWE on the main roster. But he is the sole reason why he isn't where he is right now. It goes Roman, John Moxley, and Seth Rollins. Before... It was Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, and John Moxley. And now where it stands right now is where it will stand for the rest of their careers because Rollins fucked Rollins, not the fans. There was another Seth Rollins piece of information here. He mentioned in the same fucking show that A feud with Roman Reigns needs to happen. No, no, it wasn't on that fucking idiot's podcast. This was actually with Complex Sports Podcast. Never heard of them. He says a feud with Roman Reigns needs and has to happen. He says, and I quote, I think it's just one of those things that's kind of inevitable. When you look at the characters, when you look at where we're at, you know, and when you see two top guys kind of performing at such high levels parallel to each other, yeah, This guy lives in denial. Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins are parallel to one another? Give me a fucking break, Rollins. You're nowhere near on his planet. Give me a break. I think it's very easy to ask the question, okay, when are their paths going to cross or what's that going to look like? When is it going to happen? 
And I think especially having us on the same show on Friday Night SmackDown, I mean, it seems like it's inevitable at some point. It's one of those matchups that has to happen. So whatever, wherever, it is always good between me and Roman Reigns. Folks, I'm not going to spend too much time on Rollins and this story, but I will say this. That match does not need to happen and should not happen at all. And the reason is because if Rollins gets into the ring with Roman Reigns, Rollins himself is going to turn Roman Reigns into a babyface. And for all the wrong reasons, we don't need it, we don't want it, and it shouldn't happen. Rollins is a fucking disease to everybody that is higher on the card to him. Where Rollins is right now is where Rollins exactly should be, putting others over like a Cesaro, like a Big E. Those types of guys. If Rollins gets in the ring with Reigns, Reigns will revert right back to 100% babyface, and that's not what we want to see. We're going to get into hour two here, guys. Got to take a little bit of a breather, man. I am on my fucking game tonight, man. Holy shit. Ah, that feels so good, man. I really recommend I really recommend this liquid death, man. I love this shit. It's my it's my official drink of the podcast. If you love sparkling water like I do, this is sparkling water carbonated like beer. It is so good, man. And boy, does it get hot in here. I want to thank everybody for showing up tonight, man. We got 1,700 people live. 1,745 in the chat. I love you guys, man. Thank you so very much for stopping by SmackDown and the Off The Script post show tonight, man. 1,000 likes is the goal, man. Let's do it. A thousand likes. Let's kick the road to WrestleMania off in the right way, man. A thousand likes before we end the stream tonight. I want to thank my sponsor for today's show, Dr. Squatch. DrSquatch.com. Use code SCRIPT at checkout. Save 20% off. How many of you guys are just sick and tired of being wrestling marks that are stereotyped as being geeks? Smelly geeks, virgins with bad hygiene. <laughs> All the ladies think you're a part of the uh, st- 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 stupid express. We don't need that. You don't want that, man. Don't be a part of the d- 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 dummy express. Don't get that swipe left on Tinder, bro. If anybody's still using Tinder nowadays, I have no fucking idea what you guys are using as far as dating apps go. But Dr. Squatch is going to get those swipe rights. And when you sit down with her at dinner and you take her out to a nice restaurant, you can tell her about being a wrestling fan. But you know what? She's going to smell you because you got Dr. Squatch in your back pocket. Oh, man. I hate pro wrestling. I think you're a fucking virgin. But, man, you smell good. You want to go back to the apartment? DrSquatch.com. Use code SCRIPT at checkout for 20% off, man pretty much it it's my shilling of dr squatch i use it so i don't know why you guys wouldn't want to use it i smell good i'm not a wrestling geek i do what i do here and i do it the best better than anybody appreciate you guys anyway moving on with hour two here man edge edge sat middle of the ring talked about attending wrestlemania six Headlined by Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior. It's funny, we just talked about this match on Critiques and Connoisseurs. My other project with my boy Jason, Big Hodge. If you guys want to know what that is, link is down in the description below. Go and check it out. Said he knew what he was going to do for the rest of his life just by being there in the Sky Dome. Said when dreams come true and he dreams things... He has to manifest them. He said that's common sense, but common sense isn't all that common. He said he went on to become a superstar who accomplished everything. He said some people ask if if that's not enough. He said that very question shows the lack of understanding of the mentality it takes 
to see the heights he has seen and to fight back for his career for nine years. He said he didn't walk away from it. He had it ripped away from him. He said he didn't try to forge another career. This is all he wanted to do. He broke down a little. As he said, he fought back and ripped his career right back out of fate's hands. He was starting to get a little bit emotional here. Said he didn't come back for a greatest hits tour as a shell of his former self. Said he came back to headline WrestleMania. He says he won't apologize for that. Said Brian comes out there and says this could be his last WrestleMania. He asked Brian what this could be for him. He said he weaseled himself into the match and he listed all of Brian's ideas for how to be a part of WrestleMania. He said now Brian could pin Reigns. And he wouldn't be a part of it. He said instead of a one-on-one match, a clash of titans from two eras, now we have some indie bookstore clerk troll sticking his nose in our business. This was great. The fact that he used that line is going to make everybody pop. It's going to make all the Daniel Bryan detractors and all the edgeheads pop. I thought that was a great line by Edge. Now we have some indie bookstore clerk troll sticking his nose in our business. Edge said Reigns walked around like people owe him for creating this. He said he doesn't owe Reigns anything. But Reigns owes him. He said Reigns came to WWE as part of a three-man group and made his entrance through the crowd and used a spear as a finisher. Well, who set that template for you? Your Samoan Edge. He says he's good, and he's always been good. He says he sees what he has become. He said he came back to swing for the fences, and Reigns is his green monster. He said they had their match ripped away from them, and the fans had it ripped away from them as well. No, it, it wasn't actually ripped away from me, because the match that we got now was the match that I wanted. He said the lemmings chant yes, like they used to chant what? He said this match happens 10 years to the day that he was forced to retire. He said there is no touching video packages about that with the piano music playing in the background. Nothing. If it was Brian, that narrative would be driven into the ground. He asked why he has to remind everyone of this. He said since his return, he hasn't received the respect he deserves Said he had to fight back from a torn tricep to win the Rumble, so he shouldn't have to jump through hoops. He said coming back from a triple fusion in his neck, and no athlete has ever done that. And then he started to yell that nobody knows the pain he has gone through to get this back. He said this isn't a part-time gig who is phoning it in. He said he is in this, and he will slap him in the face or this is a slap in the face to him and his work ethic, and he was fuming and yelling at this point. He says it's time to take back and demand the respect that he deserves. He said he is the rated R superstar. He said you can call it fate or God's will, but he is the next universal champion because I've dreamt it. Now I will manifest it. This promo was fucking fantastic. I don't know what you want me to say here. I'm not sure if... uh, Anybody else could deliver the type of promo that Edge cut the way he did. Edge is truly one of the best in the business. And again, like I said, in regards to Daniel Bryan, everybody that is aspiring to be in this business, when you need to work on your promo ability, you need to get that right. You're going to look at this promo right here. You're going to look at this guy right here. A babyface Edge is not cutting this promo. This promo can only come from the Rated R Superstar, and WWE should be counting their fucking blessings that they turned him heel right before this match. This is the best edge that we've gotten all WrestleMania season, and this is the best edge that we've gotten since his return last year. This was great. Unbelievable. Like I told you before, Sony Deville said this WrestleMania is awesome, and No one could have imagined Edge, Brian, and Reigns in the main event. Sonya, like I said, said it should have been Reigns versus Edge in a singles match. And it's not fair that Roman Reigns has this type of opportunity in front of him where 
he could lose the match, and the odds against him are now greater. So I don't know what they're doing with that. Obviously, that was left in the show tonight for a reason, so we will see what happens with that. Now, Reigns cut a, uh, cut a promo at the end of the show. We'll talk about him a little bit later. But I do have news on a lot of Roman Reigns aspects going into WrestleMania. So we'll save that for a little bit. Moving on to Sasha Banks. Kayla interviewed Sasha Banks. She said she wants Bianca to give her her all. And she's going to give it right back, boss style. She said when she makes her tap out, she'll realize her place is beneath her. She said she's better and the best, which makes her the B-E-S-T. She laughed very obnoxiously, which I hope she gets rid of because it just doesn't sit well with her or me. She did her laugh and flung her hair and smiled, and that was pretty much the last pitch for Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair. It's going to be a great match, but I, I think I've ranted all that I can on Bianca Belair and Sasha Banks. I, I really don't have anything else to say as far as what they've done on this WrestleMania build and where we're going into this match tomorrow night in the main event. In the main event spot, the last match on the show will be Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair. Now, I got news on Bailey, and I'm mentioning this here because I've pushed for Bailey to not only be included at WrestleMania, but I actually pitched from the beginning of the year Bailey winning the Royal Rumble. Bailey's been an unbelievable heel in her role. She's done it incredibly well. She's not on WrestleMania, which is a fucking sin. And nobody knows what's going on with Bailey. Rumors are starting to circulate that Becky Lynch is on her way back. High-ranking WWE official or management in Nick Khan had a conference call right before WrestleMania. And he mentioned that Ronda Rousey and Becky Lynch will be back on television soon. Nick Khan is the president of WWE. Now, if they're coming back, it's going to be soon, I do believe. Now, as far as Bailey goes, what is she doing at WrestleMania? There are rumors now coming from the Observer that Becky Lynch may be involved at WrestleMania. And if you guys remember last year when she wrestled Shayna Baszler, she drove a truck into the parking lot of the Performance Center right before her match against Shayna Baszler last year. And there is rumor right now that she may be driving that same truck into Raymond James Stadium during a Bailey ding-dong hello talking segment or talk show segment. This could explain why Bailey isn't on the WrestleMania 37 card. If you want to look at it that way, maybe they were saving her for that segment with a big name. Bailey, getting Bailey on WrestleMania, it fits. I think the crowd would eat it up. It would be a nice surprise for the paying crowd there at Raymond James Stadium. Becky Lynch, obviously, coming back to SmackDown. Rollins is on SmackDown. They probably want to put them on the same brand. I don't really think that's the best idea. But I would move Becky over to Monday Night Raw because it makes more sense for her to go after the Raw Women's Championship. You gave up that championship. So you should want to get that championship back. That's the championship you wrestled Ronda Rousey for. It made a big deal over with Ronda Rousey. So if WWE puts her on SmackDown, it's not going to really be the same type of story because they're both different titles. In fact, I would move Becky Lynch over to Monday Night Raw and it looks like if you guys watched TakeOver that Io Shirai is getting a call up or what I call a demotion to the main roster. I don't have any faith in WWE booking Io Shirai on the main roster. I think Io would fit better on SmackDown than Becky Lynch. I think Becky going to Raw, putting Ronda on Raw, and giving SmackDown EO is the best way to go about it. So on Monday Night Raw, you would have Charlotte, Rhea, 
Asuka, Becky, and Ronda. On SmackDown, you'd have Io, Sasha, Bailey, and Bianca Belair. That's a, that's a good trade-off there. Now, I would merge the divisions. I don't think we need two women's divisions. I've been saying this time and time and time again. I know that's not going to happen. I'm speaking to the fucking wall when I say things like that. But I think that's the best way to go about it. But if you want to get Becky Lynch back on WrestleMania, back on WWE TV, you want to get Bailey on WrestleMania, having a ding-dong hello segment is the best way to go about it. Melcher says, if they add a Bailey talk show segment to Mania, that would likely be Lynch's return as the idea of her driving a big truck in at one of the two Mania shows during Bailey's talk show segment is something we were told was being planned at one point. That also explains Bailey seemingly not booked for the show after a year where she was the women's MVP of 2020. I like the idea. I really do. What night does it happen? I'm saying do night one. Everybody's going to be excited. Everybody's going to be anticipating something big happening. I say do it for night one. Now, there was another news story where Paul Heyman mentioned something about Becky Lynch. Paul Heyman revealed, and it's funny that Paul Heyman is talking about Becky Lynch because Paul Heyman's on SmackDown with Roman Reigns. Becky Lynch is obviously engaged to Seth Rollins, who's on SmackDown. So the fact that Paul Heyman is revealing how he would book creatively the return of Becky Lynch is, might, it might be a foreshadowing. I was going to say is a foreshadowing. It may be a foreshadowing, but it might be a foreshadowing of what we see Becky Lynch do and where she does come back. Mix that with the rumor that she's showing up on Hello, Ding Dong, Ding Dong, Hello, whatever the fucking show's called, with Bailey, who's on SmackDown, might actually play into the fact of her ending up on Friday nights. Now, Heyman spoke to sports media, the sports media podcast. Heyman revealed how he would craft the man's return to the ring. He says this, and I quote, Becky Lynch is an extraordinary talent. It would not only be very easy to write Becky Lynch, 2022 WrestleMania and the scenario and the match and where we go and how we get there. The most difficult thing about that as it will be for what I envision for Roman Reigns, as it would be for how I would craft a Ronda Rousey scenario or a Brock Lesnar scenario, the most difficult part would be editing it because the flood of ideas for these extraordinary talents who push themselves past their own limitations It's overwhelming at times, and you can only pick so many different scenarios because you have to let them all play themselves out. So coming up with something for Becky Lynch for next year's WrestleMania is not the problem. Which one you decide on is the key, is paramount to the process because there's an infinite number of scenarios that Becky Lynch would excel in. She's just that talented and that willing to push her talents past her own parameters. It doesn't really say how he would book the return of Becky Lynch. He's pretty much saying where he would return Becky Lynch and at what show. What I would do with Becky, to be quite honest with you, if she is going to go to SmackDown, I would actually have her show up on SmackDown and I would not have her immediately jump right into the Women's Championship situation. I do not want to see that happen. I really don't want to see that happen at all. If Ronda is due to come back and Ronda is going to Monday Night Raw, I would say Ronda to Raw, have her win the Raw Women's Championship, have Becky win the SmackDown Championship eventually, and I would have a unification match of sorts with those two at WrestleMania next year. That's what I would do. That's the best way to go about it. Ronda wins the Raw Women's Championship. Becky wins the SmackDown Women's Championship, being that there's a lot of SmackDown talk about Becky Lynch. Have her be the Women's Champion going into next year's WrestleMania. Have a unification match and merge the divisions. That's what I would do. You only need one Women's Championship. I've said this for years. You don't need a Raw and SmackDown Women's Championships plus Tag Team Championships. It's too much. It's too much. 
These divisions don't even look or feel like divisions. WWE just throws away half of the division and then use who they want. If you're not a Charlotte, if you're not a Sasha, you're not going to get used. And God knows what they're going to do with EO. I mean, they can't even book Asuka correctly. What makes you think they're going to book EO correctly? Becky Lynch is very easy to book. It's not about what she does. It's about WWE having that creativity with open mind and open doors and actually having fun with the talent that they have and the roster that they possess. They just don't know how to have fun and they don't know how to be creative. But if Paul Heyman is already salivating at the thought of booking Becky Lynch, Becky Lynch may be in good hands before she even comes back. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens with Becky Lynch. I fully expect her to be back at WrestleMania. Speaking of Bailey, Bailey talked about not having a match at WrestleMania 37. She was actually interviewed by Talk Sport, and she says this, and I quote, why isn't she having a match at WrestleMania? She says this, I cannot give you an honest answer. I don't know. I'm sorry, guys. It just didn't happen. So she goes on to say, even if there was something, I don't know if I would tell you guys to spoil it, meaning that is she included in Mania? Is she not included in Mania? If she doesn't have a match, is she going to be there? So it kind of lends some validity to the Becky Lynch thing that was rumored in The Observer because she said, even if there was something for me to do, I wouldn't tell you guys because I don't want to spoil it which pretty much means that she's going to be there in some way or form. Bailey noted, but yeah, it's okay. I'll be here for a long time. I might just jump the barricade and steal my own moment. If they won't give it to me, I'll just steal it. Bailey then explained that she even pitched ideas for WrestleMania. She discussed the process and how it's gotten easier over the past year. I've pitched for stuff for this past WrestleMania just because There's been so many instances this past year where the pitches have gone through and it becomes easier to talk to certain people. My brain actually started working, developing the more experience I got. So yeah, there's always ideas like that. I don't know how it goes for other people, but it's definitely open. And then she goes on to talk about the women's matches at WrestleMania. There are a total of four women's matches across two nights. Bailey said that she would like to have a non-title match but looked at the brighter side of the situation. I would have loved to have a non-title match at WrestleMania, Bailey said. Just a grudge match of sorts. Something that meant not more than a title, but a little deeper than a title. But there's always next year. I'm just so happy that more women are going to be represented, and I know the two title matches are going to be killers, so we really can't be bummed out about it. We just got to look at the bright side of things, I guess. And then I read today or seen today on social media, Bailey was lobbying for a match against Beth Phoenix at WrestleMania. So she's trying, but I do expect Bailey to be there in some way. WWE would be fucking foolish to not have Bailey represented in some way at WrestleMania 37. Moving on here, man. Sami Zayn walked up to a boxing ring with Logan Paul training with his brother, Jake Paul. So somehow WWE managed to get both Logan and Jake Paul on WWE television. Sami went up to them and said the trailer is huge and is getting so much attention. He thanked Logan for the help. Sami then suggested that they spar together in the ring. Sami was very excited and he was skipping his way out of the venue. And he started to punch punch, uh, boxing bags and punching bags on the way out. He said he forgot his gear. Let me go get my gear in the car. And the security guard guard was there at the door because the door had closed on Sami Zayn. So when Zayn left the venue, the door closed and locked him out. Then he started to knock on the venue door. The security guard showed up. And then he told Sami Zayn that they were closed. So Sami Zayn was like, well, I was just I was just in there. I was just in there, and he was very upset that he couldn't get back into the venue. So then he shows up at ringside with Corey Graves and Michael Cole, and he was complaining to the commentary team, 
Why would you show that footage? You're not seeing the truthful footage. He said it was media bias to show selective images. He said Logan yelled at the security guy and they had breakfast after this. He desperately said everything is fine between them. So Corey Graves said, you want to know how I know Sammy's telling the truth? What did Jake Paul and Logan Paul have for breakfast? And then he mentioned something about a a grapefruit salad, but he stuttered getting the words out. I laughed. I thought that was great. He desperately said everything was fine. He went on and on and on about the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal as the competitors made their way to the ring. And Kevin Owens attacked Sami Zayn from behind. They brawled at ringside. KO slammed Sami into the announce table. Sami avoided a, 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 a KO who was trying to attack him at the scene. KO yelled at Sami that he can run now, but he will see him on Sunday night at WrestleMania. This was great. I love Sami Zayn. I think he's one of the best parts of SmackDown, and he's really killing this conspiracy theorist gimmick, man. I love it. It's really going well for Sami Zayn, and I'm very excited about Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn right now on night two of WrestleMania. So we got the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal happening, man. Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. I got to say this. I'm not really going to go over what happened too extensively here because the match ultimately means nothing. But what this battle royal is, is everybody that WWE doesn't give a shit about. And you're not going to hear that from other podcasts in the community. You're not going to hear this from the check marks on social media. You're not going to hear this from the obviously paid WWE sponsored podcasts and the people that work for Fox. You're not going to hear it from them. Everybody in this match, I'd say 98%, 99% of the people in this battle royal, WWE doesn't give a shit about. They don't give a shit about any of these guys. And if WWE fired all of them, WWE programming would not feel it at all. You would not even know they are gone. That's sad. That is the sad reality of the situation, folks. Honestly. There's a lot of talent in this match that is being misused so badly. And the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal should be fucking obliterated. How dare WWE use this as a way to get everybody involved at WrestleMania? And it wasn't even at WrestleMania. It was on SmackDown. So all of these guys had a missed opportunity to wrestle in front of live fans at WrestleMania after being in the Thunderdome away from live human interaction for over a year. How much does that suck? It is awful. I would get rid of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. I would put the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania, get rid of it as its own standalone pay-per-view. I would have qualifying matches to gain entry into the ladder match, whether you want to do six or eight competitors. Eight, I think, is a little bit too much. Some years we've had 10. That's way too much. Eight, I think it's too much. I think six is the right number. You have qualifying matches. You have three from Raw, three from SmackDown, and you do one match per week. And it gives at least a segment of the show. It gives a segment of the show some value, some importance, and you give undercard and mid-card guys something to fight for that otherwise had nothing to fight for. With the guys in this match, you mean to tell me that you can't book qualifying matches for a Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania to make the match feel important? You do realize that the Money in the Bank ladder match is the most, or at least one of the most, entertaining and popular matches in all of WWE. And you refuse to take the pay-per-view concept and kill it and put it right back where it belongs at WrestleMania. You mean to tell me you can't come up with a new pay-per-view concept or you can't come up with an old concept and bring an old concept back to life? What's the difference? What is the difference? The gimmick pay-per-views are passe. 
They've overstayed their welcome. You even fucked up the elimination chamber. Year after year after year, especially this year, it means nothing. Money in the bank, what have you done with the winners as of late the last three years? Nothing. You got a fucking gimmick that lasts you 12 months and WWE blows its load in one night. Sometimes the night of. Or giving it to The Miz. And then having him be a fucking WWE joke champion where he's champion one week and then the next week he's dancing in fucking bunny costumes. Whee! You know? Give me a break. Hell in a Cell, get rid of it. TLC, get rid of it. Oh, it's October. Hell in a Cell. Oh, it's December. Time for tables, ladders, and chairs, and sometimes stairs. Money in the bank at WrestleMania. Get rid of all of the gimmick pay-per-views. This is a joke. A complete fucking joke. Kalisto. Grand Metallic. Humberto. Carrillo. Tucker. Elias, Corbin, Jay Uso, Shelton Benjamin, Shelton Alexander, Eric of the Viking Raiders, Murphy, Drew Gulak, Jackson Riker, Mace, Slapjack, and T-Bar. Who, by the way, Slapjack, Mace, and T-Bar were still in retribution gear, and retribution is no more. Why did they come out in retribution gear? You didn't even finish the fucking storyline. Are you going to fucking tell the storyline that is remaining there to break them up and give these guys their old identities back? If not, why are they in there as retribution if retribution is dead? Very bizarre. Mustafa Ali, Lindsay Dorado, uh, Angel Garza, and Shinsuke Nakamura. Tozawa was the first eliminated. Oh, I'm sorry. I said Tucker before. There you go. Tucker was eliminated number two. There you go. So the rest of the field then looked at Shelton and Cedric Alexander. They all collectively eliminated both of those guys for whatever reason. I have no fucking idea. I guess it's better if all of the field eliminated them instead of them going out one by one by fucking some irrelevant pro wrestler. Gulak was then eliminated. T-Bar and Mace tossed Carrillo out of the ring. Slapjack was tossed out. Elias and Riker were squaring off against Mace and T-Bar. Riker and Elias were eliminated by Ali. And then Ali eliminated Mace. T-Bar was eliminated next. Dorado eliminated Kalisto with a big kick. Metallic then eliminated Dorado. Corbin then tossed Met- Metallic out. Corbin also eliminated Murphy. Nakamura eliminated Garza. It came down to Jay Uso, Baron Corbin, Ricochet, Nakamura, and Ali. My point proven. My point proven with the Battle Royal, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the last remaining guys in this match. Uso, Corbin, Ricochet, Nakamura, and Ali. Doesn't that sound like a great field for a six-man money-in-the-bank ladder match at WrestleMania? Certainly sounds like one to me. Minus one guy. If the Battle Royal is taking place, why would we care when all of the irrelevant guys that you don't give a fuck about, and actually, they don't give a fuck about anybody here, but if guys like this are going to be the last ones in the end, why do we have to watch an entire Battle Royal knowing that none of those guys are going to win? Ever. Ever. Why not just do money in the bank ladder match qualifying matches? And these guys, these types of guys, gain entry, and the match itself will be more important. Monday Night Raw SmackDown will be more important because there's qualifying matches. WrestleMania's card would be fleshed out a little bit better. No, but JD doesn't know anything. JD's negative. JD is uh, cancer to the IWC. Give me a break, folks. I am... Somebody that has the best interest of WWE in his heart and soul. What exactly have I stated here that is so terrible and so against what you believe? Give me a break. So we got these guys, Ricochet and Ali, battled on the ring apron and Ricochet eliminated Ali. Goodbye. Uso super kicked Ricochet to the floor. 
Corbin and Uso double team Nakamura. Uso then surprised Corbin with a super kick and tossed him over the top rope. Corbin held on. Nakamura gave him a running knee to knock him to the floor and eliminate him. Came down to Uso and Nakamura. Nakamura landed a big tornado kick to drop Uso. He gave Uso a STO. He then signaled for the Kinshasa, but Uso super kicked him instead. Nakamura came right back with a Kinshasa anyway. Uso, though, countered Nakamura and overhead tossed him to the floor to win the Battle Royal. And here I thought Shinsuke Nakamura was going to win the Royal Rumble, folks. Jay Uso is the 2021 winner of the Andre the Giant Catering Battle Royal. Great. So as he celebrated, Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman walked out, and Uso ignored the trophy. He got in the ring, and he standed. He stood there, standed. Not even a fucking word. Stood there with his emotions shifting to Roman Reigns. So Roman Reigns got into the ring, and this was the final part of the night. Cutting a promo because Brian had one and Edge had one. Now it's Roman Reigns' time to cut a promo. Reigns, in the ring, says, I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed I even have to be here. I'm not a politician. I'm not running for president. I don't have to sell myself to you. I've got more things to worry about. He said he's in a match that he can lose even if he's not pinned. He said since he's there, he might as well state the obvious. He said on Sunday night he's going to show up and win. He said it might be arrogant, but to him, it's his humble beginnings. Show day is the easy day. Because every single day of the week, when you prep at a 12, the 10 comes easy. He said, show up and win means when Roman Reigns shows up, WWE is winning. I see no lies detected there, Roman Reigns. When Roman Reigns shows up, WWE is winning. No lies at all. He said he could be Edge and Daniel Bryan and have one good week. He said Bryan had one big win. Edge was a badass for one week. He said since SummerSlam, he's been doing it week after week for 30 weeks in a row. And the numbers don't lie. Who do you think changed the ratings for this show? Me. Who do you think made this title relevant? The one everybody wants. Me. Ah, I see no lies detected again. Mr. Reigns. He laughed and he said, it's time to talk about the dreamers. He said, Brian is tired of hearing no and wants everyone to say yes to him. And now he's telling, telling everyone he made him tap out. A. You tapped out, chant rang out, which looked absolutely cringe. Roman Reigns actually stopped mid-sentence to acknowledge a fake piped in, you tapped out, chant. It looked ridiculous. Stop it. Stop it, please. Reigns shook his head in disgust at the chant. He told Daniel Bryan, he called Daniel Bryan DB, by the way. He told DB he is hanging on and he's never going to be champion because he can't make him tap out. He shifted to Edge and he said what he said was garbage. He said he took it from him and he took it from everybody else. He said this is where the comeback story ends. He said the big dream ends for Edge being in the ring with him at WrestleMania, and that's where his begins. He said if they think he, or what they think he did this year was special, wait till you see what comes next. What Roman Reigns did this year was very special. So for him to say wait till he sees, or they see, we see what comes next, that is quite the interesting thing to think about there, man, because how much better can Roman Reigns actually get? He said, dreamers are selfish because it's all about them. He said, he's the man with the golden hand and everything he touches has success. Ah, number three. I see no lies detected here. Roman Reigns. Unreal how much truth Roman Reigns can drop in one fucking promo. So he asked Paul Heyman if that was right. 
And before he could finish his sentence, Heyman said, yes, sir, you saved mine. He asked Jay Uso, who gave him the best year of his career, and Uso said, shook his head, yeah, yeah, Us. He says he's going to crush Edge's dreams. He said, as his counsel says, this isn't a prediction, it's a spoiler. He says he's going to wreck everybody and smash them and pin them, and the referee's going to count one, two, three. He said they'll look up and see a, a man greater than him holding the belt up as a million dollars in pyro goes off at Raymond James Stadium. And then you're going to hear the whole world acknowledge me. And that was it. That was it. That was the final promo that you all witnessed before WrestleMania. Roman Reigns is on fire, man. And, you know, it is unreal that there are people out there. There are people out there that legitimately want this man to lose the Universal Championship. How could you want this man to lose the Universal Championship after a promo like that, after the year you've been given on SmackDown? You do realize that without Roman Reigns, the way you see him right now, SmackDown is as bad, if not worse, than Monday Night Raw. Roman Reigns is holding this show up by his golden glove alone. Everything he said in this promo was a shoot. It was a shoot. It's all true. And that's what makes it so great. Brian cut a great promo. Edge cut a great promo. Reigns cut the promo he needed for his character. Edge cut the promo that he's upset with Daniel Bryan weaseling himself into his spotlight. Daniel Bryan cut a great underdog babyface promo where everybody told him no, but he said yes. Three different visions. Three different WrestleManias here. You really want the one thing that is going to stand above all at WrestleMania and deliver unpredictability and the most excitement that this WrestleMania season has seen. You want something that is genuinely going to embody what WrestleMania is. You want something that is going to embody what a WrestleMania main event should be. It is this match on Sunday night. At this point, everybody's been so good. Edge has been a little iffy to me. Edge has been a little iffy. He's been great the last three weeks. He's turned heel. Roman has been the best heel in the business for God knows how long right now, since SummerSlam. Daniel Bryan, give or take, Daniel Bryan is a main event guy, no matter if you love him or hate him. But at the end of WrestleMania, you are going to be looking at this match as the one thing that fully embodied everything that WrestleMania and a main event at WrestleMania should be. It is about the title. It is about the prestige, the tippity top of the mountain that these guys want to be at. That's what WrestleMania is. I feel like we haven't gotten that since Daniel Bryan last won the WWE Championship at WrestleMania 30. There's been nothing about a WrestleMania in between those WrestleMania, this WrestleMania and that WrestleMania. There's nothing in between that's really captured the importance of what real, what really matters at WrestleMania. That's this match. I love it. Absolutely love it, man. Quickly, I want to go over some predictions. And then I want to talk about some rumors in regards to Paul Heyman. Or not rumors, he actually said this in regards to WWE creative, which I find to be a little uh, a little iffy as far as Paul Heyman's allegiance to WWE. I guess we'll do that now first. I got this one thing on Paul Heyman, and then we'll get into the quick preview and predictions of WrestleMania. Paul Heyman said that there's more creative freedom in WWE than ever before. This is a bold-faced lie. Now, he spoke to sports media, This is obviously the same people that's discussed Paul Heyman and Becky Lynch. Now, Paul Heyman would book Becky Lynch. Paul Heyman was asked if he he now had more creative control than ever before. This inevitably led to a discussion regarding WWE superstars being handed scripts, scripted promos, which they have to recite every single week. Heyman stated that there is more creative freedom now in WWE than ever before and went on to defend scripted promos by mentioning popular shows such as 
Peaky Blinders to make his point. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't there news articles when Paul Heyman was executive director of Monday Night Raw? Wasn't there news articles when Paul Heyman was in charge on Monday night that he wanted to move away from scripted promos and give, and give those that WWE genuinely trusts bullet points so that they may go out there and cut a more genuine promo instead of sounding like a robot, disingenuous, or being given a script written by somebody in creative who doesn't know jack shit about the characters that they're actually writing for. Didn't Paul Heyman push for that? Weren't we told that? Didn't we read that? What exactly changed from then until now? I don't really get it. He says this, and I quote, I dare suggest it's more the case now than ever before, especially on Talking Smack. Kudos to the performers who, A, raise their game on the show, and B, trust me enough to open up when they're sitting next to me. And kudos to Kayla Braxton for simply surviving me, let alone tolerate me. As for others, that's something without a perfect answer. Vince McMahon owns a content creation conglomerate that now has on the table in application three separate billion dollar deals. And knowing Vince, he's probably working on more. He's probably trying to envision the first ever trillion dollar content deal. When you have such deals, you have to protect those deals from someone else screwing them up. So if someone goes out to the ring on live TV or a live stream and they say something that is wrong and it gets through, it would cause a major scandal and cancel culture or whatnot could deservedly get WWE thrown off Fox or NBC Universal or Peacock. That would blow a billion dollar deal. So who's to blame besides Vince McMahon for saying, I want to know what this person is saying before they say it. Peaky Blinders doesn't live. It's filmed or doesn't go live. It's filmed. You know what these characters are going to say. I never heard of Peaky Blinders, so I have no idea what he's talking about. It's not live. It's filmed. You know what these characters are going to say. Therefore, if someone walks out to the ring, Vince McMahon has the right to know exactly what that person is going to say. Otherwise, he's jeopardizing the shareholder's right to return on their investment. They're hoping and counting on the chairman to maintain creative control of this environment that can always go wrong. As WWE, as a scripted performance that allows some improv, tries to keep control of that environment. The same way other dramas on television present these characters in scripted situations. You know, there's a reason why I love Paul Heyman genuinely. I love Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman, I've always said time and time again, is one of the most brilliant minds, if not the most brilliant mind in the business today. And I was on board with him totally running Monday Night Raw. I, I said it then, I'm going to say it now. If you gave Paul Heyman a year on Monday Night Raw without the influence of Vince McMahon, without the influence of a Bruce Prichard, without the influence of anybody that has been fucking just... Given that Vince McMahon mentality, brainwashed by the Vince McMahon mentality, Paul Heyman would make a difference on Monday Night Raw. You would see it. You would feel it. You would hear it. What Paul Heyman said here makes absolute sense. But the fact of the matter is, he said that more creative freedom in WWE now exists more so than ever before. That is false. That is false. He's talking about talking smack. He's talking about a platform that a WWE previously canceled because it broke down the fourth wall because Vince McMahon was not able to really have a grasp on it. He didn't really know what was going on. He finally woke up and saw what was going on, canceled it, brought it back because now He's in complete control of everything that's going on inside that Thunderdome because of the reasons Paul Heyman stated. But for Paul Heyman to say that there's more creative freedom in WWE now than ever before, that is false. Talking Smack does not really even own 10% of WWE's creative freedom. It's 5% for Talking Smack and 5% for Raw Talk, and then 90% of it is scripted WWE garbage that is manipulated and handcuffed by Bruce Prichard and Vince McMahon. Paul Heyman has creative freedom. 
Paul Heyman has creative freedom over Roman Reigns, Jey Uso, and Brock Lesnar. And he might have others on SmackDown. There's, without a shadow of a doubt, no reason to believe why Paul Heyman isn't involved with Apollo Crews. You think Bruce Pritchard is involved with Apollo Crews and turning him heel and transforming him and the detail that went into Apollo Crews' heel turn? That's all Paul Heyman. I would be a betting man on that fact. When Becky Lynch comes back, who do you think is going to be in charge of Becky Lynch? He loves Becky Lynch. Obviously, Paul Heyman has influence backstage because if he didn't, he wouldn't be with WWE's number one act in Roman Reigns. So Paul Heyman has all the creative freedom in the world. Everybody else has to live and die by what Bruce Prichard and Vince McMahon ultimately say. They've created such a toxic environment backstage that creative freedom, it it doesn't even exist. Freedom is not in their vocabulary. Freedom is not in their dictionary. Paul Heyman has creative freedom. The rest of the roster does not. Kind of a clickbaity title there for this news article. So fuck whoever I uh, took this article from. They worded it correctly. He's talking about raw talk and talking smack. Not about WWE backstage, but I do get where he's coming from as far as WWE wanting to script promos. He gives 100% validity as to why they need to do that. But that doesn't mean you can't give your more seasoned vets with seniority and tenure bullet points and not having to script them so heavily. They don't need to be scripted. As long as you have somebody on that roster that's working towards that seniority level. There should be no reason why you can't give them bullet points. It's got to be something that you should earn. Can't give it to everybody. Not going to go out there and, you know, not script a fucking Mustafa Ali. God knows what the fucking guy would say, you know, or Buddy Murphy. You got to work your way up to that. The more work you put in, that should be one of the perks that you get. Hey, I don't need you to write for me anymore. I've been here for 15 years. You got to trust me at some point to do the right thing. Tell me what you want me to say, and I'll go out there and I'll say it in my own words. That's the way it should be done. WrestleMania. Let's go over quickly these predictions for night one and night two. Sasha Banks versus Bianca Belair. I'm going with Sasha Banks. I think Bianca Belair, I said it before, I'm going to say it again. I don't think she's ready. Sasha Banks has done nothing with that SmackDown Women's Championship We need Sasha Banks to retain that championship. Bianca Belair has more than enough time to build herself up better than what we've seen right now. Sasha Banks retains the SmackDown Women's Championship. Bobby Lashley will defend the WWE title against Drew McIntyre. This is opening the show. It is confirmed. So the first entrance you'll see is Drew McIntyre. WWE is going to have a very difficult time in Drew McIntyre. The reason why I think they had this match open the show is because if Drew McIntyre is really winning the championship, they don't want McIntyre to be booed out of Raymond James Stadium. And if they did put this match on last, I said this three weeks ago. I said this on Off the Script this past weekend when I talked about this and why this match should open. Drew McIntyre undoubtedly was walking into Raymond James Stadium getting booed out of the building. Nobody that watched Monday Night Raw who watched Bobby Lashley in the Hurt Business is booing Bobby Lashley. Nobody. Bobby Lashley, the way he's been booked and the Hurt Business and how popular they were before they broke them up, Bobby Lashley is a cool baby, uh, is a cool heel. And Drew McIntyre is the overbearing, just annoying baby face, genuine baby face that WWE seemingly has made into a boring act. If that closed the show, no doubt Drew McIntyre would be booed out of Raymond James Stadium. He's still winning the title, and it's going to be a little bit less if it opens the show because we got a whole four hours of show to go through. But Drew McIntyre is winning that WWE title. He's winning that title back. And the question is, who does McIntyre defend that title against after he wins it? The New Day versus AJ Styles and Omos. I have every right to choose the new day in this match. But I'm honestly going with AJ Styles and Omos. They've looked like shit. They've looked like shit. And AJ Styles has taken losses to the new day in singles matches on Monday Night Raw. 
And I don't see almost losing his first match in a WWE ring. AJ Styles has also never held a tag team championship in WWE. There's a first for everything, folks. AJ Styles and Omos are going to be your new Raw Tag Team Champions. And I, again, ask the question, what exactly is going to happen after this? Who is going to challenge for those Tag Team Championships in a division that has no other teams but these two teams? Braun Strowman versus Shane McMahon in a steel cage match. Braun Strowman will undoubtedly take the Da, 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 dummy express into the train station and run out of WrestleMania very fast as a victor on Saturday night. Cesaro versus Seth Rollins. I'm going with Cesaro. He needs it. WWE has pushed the narrative that this is his first singles match at WrestleMania. That clearly means he's going to win. I hope so. Should be the match of the night. Tag Team Turmoil. Catering and Catering 1.5 versus Lana and Naomi versus Natalia and Tamina versus Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot. I want to say Natalia and Tamina by the way they've been booked, but they've been booked way too strong for consecutive weeks in a row. I'm going with Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot. I think Carmella and Billy Kay are a part of this match too, but they're not winning. Nobody wants to see them win. That's a joke. I'm going with Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot to win this thing. And then I'm going with Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot to win the Women's Tag Team Championships because I had enough of Nia Jax and Reginald and Shayna Baszler needs to be a badass bitch like she was back on NXT. She needs to be by herself. So I'm going with Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot. Night two, Asuka versus Rhea Ripley. I'm going with Asuka. I don't give a fuck if it's Rhea Ripley's first match on the Monday Night Raw roster. I don't care. I'm going with Asuka. Rhea Ripley should not be the Raw Women's Champion. It makes zero sense. And Asuka has been done dirty for the last nine months. Asuka needs a victory. Big E versus Apollo Crews. I'm going with Apollo Crews to finally get the Intercontinental Championship. Finally. Should be a great match and Big E's going to move on to a world title situation. United States title, Matt Riddle versus Sheamus. I'm going with Sheamus to become the new United States champion. Matt Riddle and his days as champion are flying away like the birds in his intro. Bray Wyatt as the burned fiend versus Randy Orton. Who's going to win this one, folks? Is Randy Orton going to burn the fiend and bury the fiend once and for all? No. Bray Wyatt obviously going to win. And the match, I'm telling you right now, I am predicting... You want a worst match of the entire weekend? That is the match that is going to take that honor. No doubt about it. Kevin Owens versus Sami Zayn. I'm going with Kevin Owens. Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler will lose the tag team championships against Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot, like I said. And the Universal Championship. Roman Reigns versus Edge versus Daniel Bryan. This is a tough one, man. I don't want Roman Reigns to lose the championship. I don't. But I just have a feeling that Edge is going to beat Daniel Bryan, pin Daniel Bryan, and win the Universal Championship. I do. I think Reigns should win. Edge should go back to Raw. Bryan and Reigns have a couple month-long feud. And Roman Reigns continues to build his heel character as the Universal Champion. But I just have a feeling they're going to give it to Edge. The one reason why I say that is because Edge says that this match is happening on the anniversary of his 10 years since he's been back. Since he retired. Since he went away. 10 years to the day this match is happening. I mean, that's poetic justice right there, folks. I'm going with Edge, pinning Brian. Reigns shall remain untouched. But I want Roman Reigns to walk out. I want Roman Reigns to walk out as Universal Champion on Sunday night in the main event of WrestleMania. What a fucking review, guys. What a goddamn review, man. I appreciate you guys hanging with me. 1700 live tonight. 
We are almost at a thousand likes, man. We need a, another 170 in the chat. Can we do it live? I appreciate you guys, man. Super chats are open. We're going to go over the super chats, but I want to thank everybody for joining me tonight. Follow me on social media. That's Twitter and Instagram. At JD from NY206. Go and check out Dr. Squatch. DrSquatch.com. Use code SCRIPT at checkout for 20% off. Go check out all the other videos that you might have missed this week, man. Monday Night Raw, NXT Night 1 and Night 2 of Stand and Deliver, AEW Dynamite. Lots of stuff to catch up on. I will be live tomorrow night for the WrestleMania 37 Night 1 post show. And then the same thing on Sunday night. There will be no off the scripts this weekend. I'm saving myself for WrestleMania, man. Most of the news I gave you happened in this show. There's really not much to go over. And please hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell for all notifications, guys. It really means a lot to me if you hit that subscribe button. We're doing it big, and there's even bigger things to come for the channel. Really great stuff coming up. I got the new layout, a tease for the new layout. I can't wait to unveil it for you guys, man. No more of this wall, no more of this fucking picture-in-picture -picture layout that everybody else is doing, man. We are going to be inside the actual venue. We're going to be inside the actual venue. I am going to be showing you what is actually inside the fucking venue, man. You're going to be seeing it. And you're going to be seeing it next week, I hope. I hope. From what I was told, next week. Can't wait. Also, tomorrow, a new episode of Critiques and Connoisseurs with my boy Jason. We're talking about The Undertaker and the legacy of The Undertaker while drinking an exclusive WWE wine in commemoration with The Undertaker and his retirement, man. Check it out. Should be up on Critiques and Connoisseurs YouTube channel around 3 p.m. tomorrow getting your WrestleMania day started the right way. Let's go over these Super Chats, man. I got to get into my YouTube studio because YouTube, they just don't know how to fuck things up, man. I'm sitting inside this studio here and I got no YouTube Super Chats coming on in. It's unreal. It is unreal. Let's see what we got going on here, man. I appreciate all the Super Chats tonight. Thank you guys so, so very much. We got Logan McCall with a $5 Super Chat. The Strowman Express. Wee! Thank you, Logan. Jacob Donnelly with a $10 Super Chat. I'm sure I'm in the minority, but I kind of want Sasha to retain the title at Manny. Bro, you ain't in the minority. You're in the majority. Seriously. I'm all for making new stars, but nothing about this build has been about Bianca looking like championship-worthy material, in my opinion. Very disappointing. I absolutely agree with you, Jacob. I went on a uh, heated rant before about Bianca Belair. I mean every fucking word about it, man. Every word. Thank you for the $10, bro. I'll see you tomorrow. Reese with a $4.99 Super Chat. JD, I swear, weeks like this make watching you the highlight of my whole week. Thanks, Reese. This was a damn good show tonight. Needless to say, I was on top of my game tonight. Raging Girl Gamer with a $4.99 Super Chat. I don't care if Roman loses... Daniel and Edge getting booed. Also, I saw that home run from those sorry ass Braves was a nice hit, but still terrible. Listen, Rage, I might have to dump you. If you're calling Ronald Acuna Jr. terrible, I may, I may have to get ready. I don't know. Fuck the Mets, by the way. Hashtag fuck the Mets. Steven Field with a 999 Super Chat. 
What's up, JD? Finally got myself Blue Chew, and it was definitely worth the money. Keep up the good work, man. Always giving insightful information and opinions on how you view the product. Workhorse. Steven Field, I appreciate you, bro. Have fun with that Blue Chew, man. BlueChew.com. Use code JD for free Blue Chew. Cheap plug there. Coiled Phoenix, 713 with a $50 super chat. Go big or go home, I always say. And you, JD, always go big. Much love to you and, as always, the rest of the OTS family. Cold Phoenix, thank you so much. You've been really making me feel good with these Super Chat donations. I appreciate you. Thank you very, very much. Paul Wu with a $10 Super Chat. Hey, JD, I always thumbs up your videos. Thank you and all the mods for holding it down for all the OTS live streams. I promise I won't be a goon this weekend. I'll be here to hang out and party with the OTS family the next two days. Paul Wu. Come on into the venue, bro. Sit VIP with us. We're having a fucking party, man. Appreciate you. Justin with a 199 super chat. Hey, JD, the Braves won 8-1. to one. They're 3 and 4 so far. They should be fucking 6 and 1. 7 and 0, oh, I should say, with the fucking schedule they got. Thank you, Justin, for the 199. Paul Jackson, 1988, with a $5 super chat. Absolutely no reason for the Andre Battle Royal to exist. Nobody benefits from winning. It's a nothing match. Absolutely. Justin Stripling with a 999 super chat. The work you've been putting in during this busy WrestleMania week pretty much proves why you are and will always be the best podcaster in the IWC. You are the man, JD. Hashtag OTS for life. Justin, thank you, brother. Thank you so much, man. Laura Conway with a 499 super chat. This is going to be a sucky mania, but I hope Roman keeps his title. I will be surprised if it turns out to be a good show. Night two should be a good show. I'm not too crazy about night one outside that Cesaro match with Seth Rollins. And Sasha Bianca should be a good match, but everybody's using this as a political agenda. Oh, we need to create new stars. Oh, they got a main event, the, the WrestleMania show, because they're women. Give me a break. The match is going to be fine. The bill, that sucks. DJ Anime 2016. JD, keep up the good work. Enjoy watching your reviews. Braves won tonight, 8 to 1. Go, Braves. Good thing I got you guys instead of my MLB fucking app on the phone. Thank you. Paul Van Tassel with a $5 super chat. Cesaro and Rollins is going to be the match of the night for night one. I agree, Mr. Van Tassel. Susan D'Ambrosio with a $5 super chat. Roman is walking in Universal Champion and walking out Universal Champion. If they type the title off of Roman, I'm going to be pissed. Listen. Roman should be the Universal Champion until he meets Dwayne Johnson face-to-face. -face. That's it. There's nobody on that roster better than Roman. When you are in the same stratosphere as Roman, then we can talk about taking the title off of Roman for somebody else. But the thing is, nobody has gotten to that point yet. Nobody. And... If Roman is going to lose the championship... As long as he is not pinned, I'll be okay. That's the one thing about me. If they do decide, as long as they decide to take the title off him, don't pin him. These are not the guys that should be pinning Roman. John Venizzo to the Dizzy. Five dollar super chat. JD, bro, is your phone broke? I've been trying to contact you about your car's extended warranty, but you never answer. What the fuck are you talking about, dude? I've been trying to contact you about your car's extended warranty. I don't need a fucking extended warranty, man. Fuck your extended warranty. I take care of my shit, man. I don't need no fucking extended warranty. 
Coiled Phoenix, 713 with a $10 super chat. If Roman does keep the title, do you think they will throw Seth into the mix somehow or somewhere down the road? And if so, how should the storyline go in your opinion? Coiled, Rollins needs to stay as far away from Roman Reigns as humanly possible. And I'm sure it'll be a messiah versus a tribal chief gimmick and it's not going to really be all that entertaining. Nobody gives a fuck about Seth Rollins and I don't want to see it because Rollins being involved with Reigns is going to turn Reigns babyface and we don't want a babyface Reigns. But I'm sure it's going to be something S.H.I.E.L.D. related. But Paul Heyman's going to be behind it, so I might give it a shot. I might give it a shot. Mackenzie. With a 499 super chat, my favorite thing to do is smoke the magic dragon and then watch your reviews. Non-stop laughter the whole show. Also, can you please say Bruce? My good old buddy Bruce Richard. Guy's a fat slob. I love you. God Tongue with a $5 super chat. The problem is Bianca is just becoming another WWE babyface. Falls in line with WWE booking babyfaces. They all end up being nauseating fucking ox. Indigo with a $5 super chat. AJD, much respect. Another awesome week of content. Thank you, Indigo. Love you, brother. Looking forward to your content this weekend. Little plug. I will be on DJ Storm's channel tomorrow. Yeah, good luck with that. Good luck with that, bro. DJ Storms is a cool kid. He supports me. He's never done anything bad to me or said anything bad to me, so I got no fucking problem with him. He's doing his thing. If everybody wants to shit on him, that's their fucking problem. Untamed Phantom. Do you think Becky will come back tomorrow night? The one thing I will say about DJ Storms is he takes influence from the best. So how could I hate him? How could I hate him for that? Let him do his thing. Just stay out of my way. Untamed Phantom, do you think Becky will come back tomorrow night? Yes, with the 399 Super Chat. Jericho, 8131, a $10 Super Chat. Bianca has Smiley Finn Syndrome. Too much smiling and humility. They did the same thing to Paige when she came to the main roster and tainted her anti-diva gimmick. Maybe a loss will bring back the EST. Jericho, it's gotta be. It's gotta be, bro. Bianca is not faring well on the main roster. She's not. And if you think so, man, take the blinders off, put them down, clean them a little bit, or... Not even that. Just listen to me. I'll guide you in the right direction. I shouldn't have to because you should be smarter than that. But if I have to, I'll lend my services to guide you in the right direction. Phil, with a 999 Super Chat, I heard Bailey will have a ding-dong hello segment at Mania with her guest being Becky Lynch. Thoughts on that? Would that mean Becky will be back on SmackDown? Phil, I don't know if you listened to the show, but I just talked about that about 30 minutes ago. Thank you for the 999 Super Chat. Justin Stripling with a 999 Super Chat. I agree with you about Bianca Belair. She should have been her old NXT self in this buildup with Sasha Banks. Instead, Bruce and Vince ruined the buildup by making Bianca a giddy, excited character. I don't know what else you guys want me to say about Bianca Belair. It ain't looking too good, bro. Sasha Banks should win that match a thousand percent. Jack Brewer with a $20 super chat. I agree with everything you said about Bianca Belair. She was way better in NXT. The best part of SmackDown was Brian Edge and Reigns, and the Big E promo was great. Hope Big E keeps the title, but he will probably drop to Apollo. Yes, he will, Mr. Brewer. Apollo Crews will be recognized as your new intercontinental champion. It's got to be. There's no other way around it. 
Plus, he's got Wale performing his theme music, so more than likely, he's going to end up in a losing effort. Same thing with Rhea Ripley. She's got the musical act that performs her song, performing her live to the ring. She's also taking a loss as well. Reese with a uh, $10 super chat. JD, do you think it should have been Bailey versus Bianca versus Sasha in a triple threat match at Mania? No. Should have been Bailey versus Sasha and Bianca versus Asuka at WrestleMania. Anthony Bayless with a $20 bomb. You're the most honest man in the IWC. No one is as honest as you are. I know. I know, Anthony. Thank you. I don't watch WWE anymore. I find it better just to listen to your podcast about this bullshit company. This egregious company. I've listened and followed you for six years. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate the love and support for six years, brother. I appreciate the $20 super chat. Thank you, man. Maurice Lionheart Jackson with a 199 super chat. Okay, bro, which mania is your favorite of all time? I don't have one. I don't have one. WrestleMania usually is the most disappointing show of the entire year. Now, if you were asking me to give you which SummerSlam was my favorite, I could do that. Which King of the Ring is your favorite, I could do that. Which Royal Rumble is your favorite, I could do that. But WrestleMania, no. Can't do it. Sick Boy with a $5 Super Chat. Don't know what currency this is. It's $5 regardless. That will be... Uh, Transferred into American currency at some point. Sony Deville segment made me think that maybe she could cost Brian the championship on Sunday and also become Edge's manager, but who knows? That would give some legitimacy to the uh, fond looks that Paul Heyman has given Sonya Deville over the last couple of weeks. We'll see. Maurice Lionheart Jackson with a 199 Super Chat. Who is currently your top five wrestlers in the world? Roman Reigns. Kenny Omega. Adam Cole. Johnny Gargano. And Walter. In no particular order. Phil. Phil. With a 999 Super Chat. Becky posted on Instagram a picture of her working out with the caption, Nothing is guaranteed here tonight, only new eternally. If you put the first letters together, it says night one. Yes, I'm well aware, Phil. I'm well aware. Maurice Lionheart Jackson, 499. I'd like to see Mil Muertes sign with AEW. He was fantastic in Lucha Underground. I think he's in AAA. Dude is one of my favorites. Mil Muertes is a fucking beast that is a legit monster I love Mil Muertes Jack Brewer with a $5 super chat got my screwball peanut butter whiskey and Terramana tequila and 1800 tequila for Wrestlemania weekend Jack you're gonna be fucking drunk out of your mind you may miss Wrestlemania Ernie Thompson with a $2 super chat no message don't be shy bro Lauren Hutton, $2 Super Chat. Favorite match at Mania? Edge, Brian, Reigns. No doubt about it. Are you looking forward to night one or night two? P.S. You're awesome. Night two is going to be greater than night one. Thank you, Lauren. And then another $1 Super Chat, another $2 Super Chat, another $2 Super Chat. Thank you for the love, Lauren. Thank you for the love. Any prediction this weekend? We just went over it. If you, to book t- if you were to book two, if you were to book this year's WrestleMania match, I-, I don't get what you're saying. If you were to book this year Mania, what match, etc.? Oh man, I've uh, I've come up with mock WrestleMania cards all season. You got to watch the podcast, man. I gave you four right here. I gave you four tonight. Oscar versus uh, Bianca Belair, Sasha versus Bailey, Edge versus McIntyre, Brian versus Reigns. I would have done 
I don't have a problem with Apollo and Big E, but I actually originally had Seth Rollins versus Big E for the Intercontinental Championship. I've booked WrestleMania all season. We got Issa, the NYC Demon Diva with the 299 Super Chat. Sing it with me. Whoa, WrestleMania. I had that shit on cassette tape, Issa. I had that shit on cassette and I think CD as well. The fact that you brought that back, I might have to go back in the YouTube archives and find that fucking song. I'd play it right here, but I don't want to get copyright striked. JDE with a $5 super jab. Been running fever from vaccines, but I'm good. Appreciate you keeping me updated. Here's hoping that Roman, Sasha, and KO win at Mania. You got a shot, bro. You got a shot at all three of those things happening. KO's definitely beating Sammy. Sasha should absolutely beat Bianca. And Roman, I'm for him winning. But I just have a feeling they're going to give it to the rated R superstar. In Edge. I just have a feeling. I don't know. We'll see what happens, man. WrestleMania night two. I'm looking forward to that one match. No question. It's going to steal the entire show along with Sammy and KO and then Cesaro and Rollins as well. And then we got Scorpio 1117 with a $5 super chat. JD, love listening to your show. I just wanted to ask where I can find the theme you play when you end your show. It sounds awesome. Scorpio, all you got to do is go to YouTube, type in pilot, P-Y-L-O-T, the return. That's all you got to do, bro. That's the name of the song that plays when the Mustang is driving away. Pilot, the return. It should be in the description as well if I'm not mistaken. Or I might have taken it out. I have no idea. And then we got Jacob Donnelly with a $5 super chat. You excited for the new Dark Side of the Ring season? And any episodes you're looking forward to? Me personally, I'm looking forward to Bryant Pillman and Nick Gage. Uh, I'm looking forward to the Pillman one, Jacob. And I'm looking forward to the Ultimate Warrior episode. That should be a good one, bro. And Chris Jericho is now reigning over it all, and it's going to sound fucking great, man. I, th I think he he did a great job for season two. And that's pretty much everything, guys. That's all I got for you. That is all I got for you tonight and the podcast. What a fucking show, man. What a goddamn show we had. It's WrestleMania week. And we got another one here. Kelly with a $5 super chat. Take my money, JD. You're not alone on fighting off the rejects because Tokyo is worse than the U.S. when it comes to WWE shills. Truth hurts. WWE socks. Kelly, you know it. You know it. What time is it in Tokyo? You must be just awakening from your slumber. Anyway. Anyway. Guys, what a show, man. I appreciate you. We've been here for almost three fucking hours. SmackDown reviews in the books. WrestleMania discussion in the books. I don't know what else I could tell you in regards to WrestleMania. We got Sesh CJ with a 499 Super Chat. What's up, JD? I just wanted to let you know that your family is over here, bro. I've been watching for five years now. Love you, brother. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Thank you for the love, man. You guys have killed it all WrestleMania week so far. The biggest is yet to come. I can't wait, man. Follow me on social media. At JD from NY206 on Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button down below and turn on the bell for all notifications. Guys, we are less than 150 away from 1,000 likes. Can we do it before we get out of here, man? I would love if we hit a thousand likes before we get out of here. 
Go check out the Monday Night Raw review. NXT Stand and Deliver Takeover Night 1 and Night 2. Live on the channel right now. AEW Dynamite from yesterday afternoon with Jesse and I. And I'll be live back Saturday and Sunday night for WrestleMania, man. It's going to be awesome. Patreon.com slash JD from NY 206. If you want to support through the Patreon page, mouthmasker.com slash OTS for your masks. Now available in black and white. And please check out Dr. Squatch. DrSquatch.com. You guys are going to use code JD. Actually, no, that's the wrong one. Code SCRIPT at checkout. My brain is fried, man. But I'll tell you what. I'm getting in the Mustang. Windows are down. It was another pretty decent day in New York City. But I'll tell you what, man. Windows are down. I got my cold beverage. That music that you're listening to, full blast. Give me those guitar emojis in the chat right now. And I'll see you guys tomorrow night for WrestleMania Night 1 on Off The Script. I'll see you guys later. Listen, man, I had to make a pit stop. I had to make a pit stop. Edgar, you fucking beast, man, with the $50 super chat. JD, you cool-ass goon. Great review. This chat was on fire thanks to the OTS fam with all the Seth jokes. This has been a hard time. My mind is running wild. Thanks for being here. It helps entertain the mind, bro. Fucking love you, Jerry. OTS for life. Whee! Now, let me get back into the car, man. I'll see you guys tomorrow night for WrestleMania.